the statement negation of p implies negation of q is logically equivalent to which of the statements below we have been given these four statements and they are asking which among these is logically equivalent to this statement given here so this is a question from propositional logic now let's take a look at these statements so before that if we have been given a statement of the form p implies q and the converse of the statement is q implies p and the inverse is negation of p implies negation of q and the contrapositive is negation of q implies negation of p among these three statements only the contrapositive will be equivalent to p implies q these two won't be equivalent to the given statement also a statement like p implies q we can write it as negation of p or q as well so based on this info we look at the options we look at the statement negation of p implies negation of q so the contrapositive of this would be the negation of this part implies negation of this part that is q implies p and also we can write it in this form that is negation of this part or this part that is p or negation of q now we look at the options this is negation of q implies p is option 2 so this is correct p or negation of q is given here so this is also correct the other two statements are not logically equivalent to the given statement so the answer is 2 d consider the first order logic sentence for all x there exists y such that x is related to y assuming non-empty logical domains which of the sentences below are implied by f we have been given these four statements they are asking us which of these are true this is a question from propositional logic so let's try to solve this question let's first consider an example here let the domain be the numbers 1 2 and 3 and suppose the relation r is such that 1 is related to 2 2 is related to 2 and 3 is related to 3 this is an example which i wrote just now now this satisfies this condition for all x there exists y such that x is related to y when x is 1 it is related to 2 when x is 2 it is related to 2 when x is 3 it is related to 3 so the statement saying that for all x there exists y such that x is related to y is true now let's go through these statements there exists y there exists x such that x is related to y so clearly there is 1x and 1y such that x is related to y so that seems to be true from this example now if we are solving using an example we can only if if a statement is false then we can say for 100 percent sure that that statement will be false but if that statement is true for this example we can't say that that statement is always true so this seems to be true we'll come back to this later let's take an example two there exists y such that for all x x is related to y so there should be some y such that for all x x is related to that y now if you look this y is not related to any x so it is false for y equal to 1 if y equal to 2 then there exists for all x x is related to y so for when x is 1 it is related to 2 when x is 2 it is related to 2 that's fine but when x is 3 it is not related to 2 so the statement is false for y is 2 as well if y is 3 clearly x is 1 is not related to that y so saying that there exists y for all x x related to y is false we got a counter example so the statement is definitely false now let's look at statement 3 for all y there exists x such that x is related to y they're saying that whatever y we take there should be some x which is related to that y now clearly when y equal to 1 there is nothing related related to this y so this statement is also false now options 2 and 3 is false so option c and d is eliminated only a or b should be correct now let's look at the statement one it is saying that there exists y there exists x such that x is related to y in the question they have given us that for all x there exists y such that x is related to y so definitely we can take one x which will be related to some y such that which will be related to some y so and they have also given us that we have non-empty logical domain means there will be at least one x and y which is related to each other so saying that there exists y there exists x such that x is related to y is correct also statement for there doesn't exist any x such that for all y x is not related to y now again that's also true so if you look at the statement saying that for all x we can find some y 
which is related to x which is same as saying that for none of the x we will be not able to find some y which is not related to x i'll repeat that for all x there exists y such that x related to y is same as saying that for there doesn't exist any x which is not related to any y which is nothing but this statement there doesn't exist any x for which for all y x is not related to y so statement 4 is also correct these two statements are the same so the answer is b let c1 etc up to cn be scalars not all zero such that sigma i equals to 1 to n c i a i equal to 0 where a i are column vectors in r power n consider the set of linear equations a x equals b where a equal to a1 a2 etc up to a n and b equal to sigma i equal to 1 to n a n the set of linear equations have and we have been given these four options regarding solutions so this is a question from linear algebra they have framed the question in a bit confusing format so i'll break it down for you c1 to cn are scalars meaning that c1 to cn are just real numbers and a1 to an are column vectors in r power n meaning each ai is a column vector of n rows and one column so ai can be written like this it's an n by n matrix each ai is and a is nothing but the combination of a1 a2 x a3 etc up to a n so a1 a2 etc are column vectors so we can write a1 a2 up to a n these are n by 1 vectors and there are n vectors like that so a is an n by n vector here and b is the sum of i equal to sigma equal to 1 to n a n so b is also just a column vector just like a is which is the sum of all a is now we'll come to the question they have given this statement a x equal to b so a is an n by n matrix and x will be an n by 1 matrix of x's which is equal to b and they are asking us to find out the number of solutions to this equation so number of solutions for linear homogeneous equations is like ax equal to b is if rank of a is less than rank of a b it means that there is no solution the equations are inconsistent if rank of a equals to rank of a b equals to n which means that it has a unique solution if rank of a equal to rank of a b which is less than n it will mean that there are infinitely many solutions so you need to understand how to solve these equations from linear algebra topic you can refer to video lectures here to understand how we got these three points and also rank of a matrix a is the number of linearly independent row or column ve column vectors in a it's not matrix it's vector independent row or column vectors in a so based on this understanding we'll solve the question let's look at matrix a it has n vectors there but it's given that sigma i equal to 1 to n ci ai equal to 0 so some linear combination of all these ai vectors will give 0 which means that these the set of all of these are linearly dependent which means we don't have n linearly independent vectors in a1 a2 a3 etc up to a n if a1 a2 a3 all were linearly independent then sigma equal to 1 to n ci ai would never have been zero which means in a there are no n independent vectors we don't have n independent vectors in a meaning that rank of a is less than n and let's take a look at rank of a b which is a transpose with b to the right side so if you look at b you can see that b is the sum of sigma i equal to 1 to n a n so this new vector b is a sum of a1 a2 a3 etc up to a n so this is also linearly dependent to a1 a2 a3 etc up to a n so adding the new vector b doesn't give us a new linearly independent vector here so the number of linearly independent vectors in a will be equal to the number of linearly independent vectors in b which means that rank of ab is also equal to rank of a now if you look at the options we can see that rank of ab equals rank of a and that rank will be less than n which means there are infinitely many solutions so c is the answer 
Consider the following functions from positive integers to real numbers 10, root n, n, log n, and 100 by n. The correct arrangement of the above functions in the increasing order of complexities. So, this is a question from asymptotic complexity section from algorithms. We have been given these functions and we need to find out the increasing order of asymptotic complexity for these. So, if you take a look here, 100 by n is asymptotically decreasing function. As n increases, the value of this keeps on going down. And 10 is asymptotically constant n. Whatever is n, the value of 10 will remain same. It's constant. And n root n and log n will increase as we increase n. So, we need to find out which among these, what's the order among these three. So, we'll write down these three functions, log n, root n and n and take a few sample values. If you take 1, the log is 0, root n is 1, n is 1. If you take 16, log to the base 2 of n is 4, it's 2 power 4 is 16, root n is 4, n is again 16. If you take 100, the value will be 6 point something, root n will be 10, n will be 100 and if you take 1000, the log to the base 2 of 1000 is 9 point something, root n is 31 point something and n is 100. So clearly log n is decreasing, log n is increasing at a smaller rate compared to root n. So the complexity of this is greater and n is increasing at a faster rate than these two. So the correct order is 100 by n first which is decreasing then the constant n then in the increasing part log to the base 2 n root n and n. So the correct answer here is option B. Consider the following table algorithms Kruskal, Quicksort, Floyd Warshall and design paradigms divide and conquer greedy dynamic programming. Match the algorithms to the design paradigms they are based on. So this is a very straightforward question coming from algorithms topic. We have been given these three algorithms and they are asking what's the design paradigm on which these algorithms are based. So all of these algorithms you should be learning those if you don't understand those already. Please refer to the video lectures and learn those. So Kruskal is used for finding minimum spanning trees. It's a using greedy approach in order to solve. Quicksort is for solving, is for sorting an array. It uses divide and conquer design paradigm and Floyd Warshall uses dynamic programming. So based on this you can see that the correct option is C. Let T be a binary search tree with 15 nodes. The minimum and maximum possible heights of T are. Note the height of a tree with single node is 0. So in the question they are asking us what would be the minimum and maximum possible heights of a binary search tree having 15 nodes. They have also given us that the height of a tree with single node is 0. So the height of a binary search tree would be minimum when the tree is completely balanced. So I have given that tree here. Here each node has two children and that goes on propagating downwards. Each node will be having two children. This is a completely balanced binary search tree having 15 nodes and you can see that clearly the height is here it will be 0, it will be 1, it will be 2, it will be 3. So the minimum would be 3. And a binary search tree would have the maximum possible height when it is completely unbalanced. So from the node keep on adding children to any either of left side or right side. So Let's try adding all the children to the right side. So this binary search tree would look like this. This is a binary search tree with 15 nodes. The height here is 0. It will be 1 here, 2 here, etc. And the last part, the height would be 14. So the maximum height is 14. Minimum height is 3. So B is. The n bit fixed point representation of an unsigned real number x uses f bits for the fractional part. Let i equals n minus f. The range of decimal values for x in this representation is. So in the question they are asking us about fixed point representation of unsigned real numbers. So fixed point representation would be in this format. We have n bits given here and there will be a decimal point somewhere here. So the bits to the right side of the decimal point would be used to give the fractional part of the real number. and the bits to the left side of the decimal point would be giving that value of the number before the decimal point. So they are asking the range in this question. So the smallest 
real number which can be represented using n bits for unsigned it's given unsigned real numbers so smallest number would be represented in this format 000, .000 all zeros this is nothing but zero and the largest number which can be represented using n bits is 1111.1111 now if you look here this part will be n minus f in the question it's given that i equals n minus f so this part would be i and this part would be f so the largest number which we can represent using i bits is 2 power i minus 1 so this part would give the number 2 power i minus 1 and the this part will be f bits which is giving that fractional part of the number now this we can rewrite as 2 power minus 1 this bit would be 2 power minus 1 this bit would be 2 power minus 2 etc etc up to 2 power minus f now 2 power minus 1 plus 2 power minus 2 up to 2 power minus f we can rewrite it as 1 minus 2 power minus f how we got this i'll show you here consider f equals 3 then this number corresponding to this part here is 0 0.111 now this part is 2 power minus 1 this part is 2 power minus 2 this part is 2 power minus 3 so this number is 2 power minus 1 plus 2 power minus 2 plus 2 power minus 3 now consider that we are adding 0 0.001 which is 2 power minus f to this number when i am adding 2 power minus 3 to this number i will be getting 1 plus 1 is 0 1 plus 1, plus 1 will be 0 0 and 1 so this number would be 1 so clearly 2 power minus 1 plus 2 power minus 2 up to 2 power minus f plus 2 power minus f will be giving 1. So this we can rewrite it as 1 minus 2 power minus f. So the answer would be this part plus this part. That will be the total number, which is the maximum we can represent, which is 2 power, minus, 2 power i minus 1 plus 1 minus 2 power minus f, which is 2 power i minus 2 power minus f. So the largest is the smallest is 0. So the answer is D. This is a question from C programming. Consider the C code fragment below. They have given us this code. Assuming that M and N point to valid null terminated linked lists, invocation of join will A. Append list M to the end of list N for all inputs. B. Either cause a null pointer dereference or append list M to the end of list N. C. Cause null pointer dereference for all inputs. D. Append list N to the end of list M for all inputs. So, we have been given this particular code for join. This is the struct that we are using. It has a data part and an next pointer pointing to the same node. And they have given us that M and M point to valid and alternated linked list. So, N and M would look like this. These are the nodes which has a pointer to the next node like this. And the last one would be an alternator. This would be M. So, what we are doing here is we will be passing M and N to this function the pointer to the first node and then there will be a iterator, temporary iterator pointer p that's used to iterate through this linked list and by p dot next not equal to null we will be making p equals p next meaning we will be initially we will be assigning p to the first node of n and then while the next of p is not null we will be traversing p we will be moving p to the next node like this until p hyphen next becomes null at that point, what we'll do is we'll make p next equals to m. So we'll be traversing p like this. P will move to this. P will move to this. At this point, we'll see that the next is null. And what we'll do is we'll change p next from null to m. We'll be pointing it to the first node of m. So clearly, what they're doing here is we are appending list m to the end of list n. Now, there is one small issue here. In the question, they are giving us that M and N point to valid null terminated linked list. But nowhere have they given that the linked list are non-empty. Even an empty linked list, which only starts with null, is also a valid null terminated linked list. So, if N is empty, the first thing what we are doing is we will be assigning P to N. Now, P is null and we are in the condition we are trying to reference p next which is null hyper next now that will cause a null pointer dereference since p is not null we have to do another check before we were executing this particular code so the answer is it will either cause a null pointer dereference or append list m to the end of list n so b is the answer 
when two eight bit numbers a7 a6 a5 etc a0 and b7 b6 etc to b0 in two's complement representation with a0 b0 as the least significant bits are added using a ripple carry adder the sum bits obtained are s7 up to s0 and carry bits are c7 up to c0 an overflow is said to have occurred if so this is a question from digital logic when we are adding two numbers they are asking what's the condition for an overflow to occur so if you are adding two unsigned numbers the condition for overflow is that if carry is generated then it means there is an overflow but if you are adding two signed numbers the condition is different for signed numbers the condition is that if you are adding two positive numbers and the final number is a negative number or we are adding two negative numbers and the added number is a positive number that's the condition for overflow for signed number addition and in the question they are given us that these numbers are in two's complement representation which means that the most significant bit is the sign bit and the rest is for the number and these numbers are sign numbers clearly and a0 b0 is a least significant bit making a7 b7 the most significant bit so in the question the numbers are a7 is the most significant bit this is the least significant bit a7 to a0 b7 to b0 we are adding this and we are getting s7 to s0 so the condition for overflow is that either these two are positive numbers and this was a negative number if these are positive numbers then a7 should be 0 b7 also should be 0 and s7 should be 1 s7 is 1 meaning this is a negative number s7 b7 0 meaning this is a positive number so this will mean it's an overflow or the other condition is that these two numbers are negative and the sum is a positive number if these two are negative which means a7 is 1 b7 is also 1 and s7 would be 0 so this is the condition for an overflow to have occurred in these two numbers and this is option c Consider the following context-free grammar over the alphabet epsilon equals a, b, c with s as the start symbol. s gives a, b, s, c, t or a, b, c, t and t gives b, t or b. Which one of the following represents the language generated by the above grammar? And we have been given these four options. So this is a question from context-free grammars coming from theory of computation. This is the definition of the grammar and they are asking us that among the options which one represents this grammar? So, we will try to generate strings in this grammar here. Here I have written the variables in red color and the terminals in black color here. So, we will start with S always. S gives A, B, S, C, T or A, B, C, T. So, if you take a look at this, these two options here, this part will keep on generating S. A, B, S, C, T will have one more S symbol which we will need to resolve again. If we, while we keep on taking this part, S will always be there until we take this part and then s is eliminated we only have t here we only need to resolve for t after that so for our generating strings in our grammar what we'll do is we will keep on taking this part a few number of times and then we'll take this production so that s is eliminated and then we only need to resolve for t so we'll go in that manner we'll start with s s gives a b s c t we need to resolve for this s again this s again gives a b s c t the ct part is coming from here and then this s gives a b c t that's this production after that we can see that there are a few number of t's in here if you look at the grammar for t you'll see that t always gives b t or b the smallest one smallest string generated here would be b the second smallest would be b and then t results to be b b the, the next one would be b b b etc so t results to b plus that is one or more b's so each of these t's we can rewrite as b plus so this is the, this is the strings generated by the grammar a few number of a b's and then after that a few number of c b plus each of the b plus will res resolve to one or more b's so if you take a look in the s part here you can see that for each a b produced a c will also be produced each a b produced here a c will also be produced so the number of a b's will be equal to the number of c's in the strings in this grammar which means that if we have 
n a b is here like this the number of c's would also be n which means that c b plus part will also be n the number of ab's will be equal to the number of c b plus parts here so we can rewrite this grammar as ab n times and then c b plus n times now if you look at the options you will see that option b corresponds to that ab n times and then we have c b raised to m1 c b m2 etc c b mn the number of c's here is n which is decided here it's given that m1 m2 etc up to mn which meaning there are n m's here c b m1 c b m2 etc so there are c b m part is there n times which is same as what we wrote here also m1 m2 is greater than or equal to 1 which corresponds to b plus so b is the correct answer consider the c struct defined below struct data int marks 100 car grade int c number struct data student the base address of student is available in register R1. The field student.grade can be accessed efficiently using A post increment addressing mode, B pre decrement addressing mode, C register direct addressing mode, D index addressing mode X R1 where X is an offset represented in two's complement 16 bit representation. So this is a question from addressing modes in computer organization. So they have given us this particular struct. There's an instance of that called student and they're as asking us what's the most efficient way to access student.grade using which of these addressing modes. So this is how the struct would be stored. Initially there will be an integer array of 100 elements called marks. So 0 to 100 it will be marks. After that there will be a character element called grade and after that there will be an integer called C number. So it's saying that the base address of student is available in register R1. This is the base address of student. It's available in R1. And then from the base address up to 100 elements, it would be 100 integers in that array marks. And after that, there will be grade. So the way to access grade is we need to go to the register R1 and then increase this offset, which will be 100 here. 100 into the size of integer. That will be the address of accessing student dot grade now this is exactly what's given in option d index addressing what x where x is the offset which or offset will be 100 into size of integers and r1 is the base address which is the base address of this structure so d is the correct answer consider the following intermediate program in three address code p equals a minus b q equals p into c p equals u into v q equals p plus q which of the following corresponds to a static single assignment form of the above code and we have been given four options so this is a question from compiler design regarding static single assignment forms so static single assignment form is a form of writing the same thing that is used during intermediate code generation what static single assignment form says is that each time a variable is assigned a value it should be given a new name this new name we indicate by adding a subscript below there. So if you look at this here, P is assigned something A and B here and P is used immediately again, meaning that this P and this P should have the same name and then Q is assigned here. After that, P is being assigned a new value here, meaning that this should be a new name it shouldn't be the same name as this one it should be a new name after that p is used here meaning that these two should be having the same name so this p and this p should have the same name this p and this p should have the same name this p and this p should be different similarly if you look at q q is assigned here after that q is used here so this q and this q should be having the same name also there is one more q here this q should have a different name than this q here the other variables a b c u v are used only once here and nothing is getting assigned to those so we can give any name to those now we we'll look at the options here here see p1 equals a minus p p is being given a new subscript one here that's fine and here it's used as p1 so p1 and p1 is same this is correct after that we are assigning p1 equals to u into v this is wrong here p is getting assigned again so we need to we had to use a new name like p2 or something here 
so this and this this is matching this is not a different name so a is not the answer if you look at c it says that p1 equals a minus b and it's using a q1 equals to p2 into c this is also wrong this and this should be the same so this is also the wrong answer if you look at d p1 equals a minus b and then saying q1 equals p into c this and this is not same just like in c so this is also wrong now let's look at b p3 equals a minus b this is perfectly fine we had to use any number we can use p3 there's no rule saying that we have to start with p1 or something like that so p3 equals a minus b p3 and p3 the name is same after that q4 equals p3 into c so that's fine then p4 uh, see we are assigning p again and we are using a new name here this is fine after that p is used here and these two names are same so this is also fine regarding p it's perfectly fine we look at q here we are using q4 and we are using q4 only here also so this is also fine and then q is assigned again it's given a new name so this is also fine so b is the correct answer for this question this is a c programming question regarding pointers they have given us this particular code segment and they are asking the code suffers from which one of the following problems a compilation error two times compilation error and c and d it compiles successfully but causes dangling pointer and d it says it causes memory leak so let's take a look at this question option a says that it will cause a compilation error as the return of malloc is not typecast properly they are referring to this particular line return of malloc is not types typecast as insta but this won't cause a compilation error you can write down this program and try compiling it using any compiler and you will see that it won't cause any compilation error so a is not the answer b compilation error because the comparison should be x equal to equal to null they are asking us about this comparison we are written as null equal to equal to x in the question but whether we write null equal to equal to x or x equal to equal to null it's the same thing only this won't cause any compilation error in C and D, they are asking us whether it causes dangling pointer or memory leak. So, let's look at this question. Before that, let's look at what dangling pointers and memory leaks mean. A dangling pointer is this. Suppose we have a pointer pointing to a memory location. Suppose we have another pointer that's also pointing to the same memory location. And suppose we are freeing y using we are freeing this memory location using this pointer y. Now, y will be set to null, but x is still pointing to this memory location, which is invalid now since this has been deallocated so we say that x is dangling here this is dangling pointer now coming to memory leak suppose we have a pointer x which points to a memory location and then we change this pointer to point to a different memory location now we have this particular memory location assigned to our program but there is nothing pointing to this location so there is no way of accessing this memory location so this memory is leaked out from our program we can't access this memory anymore but it is assigned to the program this is called a memory leak now let's go through the program and see which of these two the program will cause so initially it says x equal to malloc size of int so x is allocated one particular integer in memory so x points to this now after that we are doing x equal to assign val int x0 when we do that assign val int x0 what it does is it will return it is we are passing a pointer x and some integer value the pointer will point to that value and then it will return this pointer so again x is reassigned here some other memory location will be returned by assign val x10 so now x is pointing to some other location now so this link is lost now if x is null return otherwise again assign otherwise again assign val after that we are printing x so clearly from here only you can see that this particular memory location which initially we assigned to x this is lost here so this program will cause a memory leak there is no dangling pointers here there's only one pointer x and that is being freed at the end there is no other pointer so this won't cause any dangling pointer so result in memory leak that is the correct answer consider a tcp client and a tcp server running on two different machines after completing data transfer the tcp client calls close to terminate the connection and a fin segment is sent to the tcp server server side responds by sending an ack which is received by the client side tcp 
As per the TCP connection state diagram RF 793, in which state does the client side TCP connection wait for the fin from the server side TCP? So this is a question from computer networks regarding TCP state transition diagram, particularly TCP connection close. So let us see what this question is saying. Here they have said that initially the client sent a fin to the server and it has received an ACK back from the server side. Now it is at this point. Now for connection to be closed completely. So far what we have seen is that from client to server side this connection is closed with these messages. Now we need to close the connection from server to the client side as well. For that the server needs to send a fin and then the client will send an ACK back to the server. Only then the TCP connection is closed completely. Now client is waiting here and they are asking which is the state in the TCP state transition diagram. To, understand, to answer this question you need to understand TCP state transition diagram. The diagram has been given in the video lectures in the TCP section. So I would say please refer to that first before answering this question. So I have given the state transition diagram for connection release here. The red lines are messages from server, the black lines are messages from the client side and the dotted line represent unusual events. On every line you can see an event slash action, player, action pair. The, what's written before the slash is the event and what's written after the slash is the action. So we'll take a look here. Initially the client is sending a fin message. So which is represented by this line. The client the event is that the client wants to close the connection so the action is that the client is sending a fin message here it will go to fin wait one state after that it has been said that the server sent an ACK back to the client so the client received an ACK which is the event and the client is not sending back anything which is fin wait 2 now what we want is that the server needs to send a fin so the client should receive a fin after that the client will send an ACK and it will go to time wait state after a few seconds of timeout it will be going to the closed state so according to the question we are in this state so it is fin wait 2 that is the answer you can look at the other messages for different events such as the server is sending fin first and all that is covered here so please learn tcb state transition diagram to understand this completely so for our question the answer is fin wait 2 which is given here option d A sender S sends a message M to receiver R which is digitally signed by S with its private key. In this scenario, one or more of the following security violations can take place. 1. S launches a birthday attack to replace M with a fraudulent message. 2. A third party attacker can launch a birthday attack to replace M with a fraudulent message. And 3. R can launch a birthday attack to replace M with a fraudulent message. Which of the following are possible security violations? So this is a question from computer security regarding birthday attack. So a birthday attack is a very interesting computer security violation. So what happens in birthday attack is there will be a sender and a receiver. Suppose a sender and receiver are trying to make a contract between each other so that they both want to sign the same contract. So a sender will make a message M. And then the sender will take the hash function of this M which will be H of M and then it will sign this message with the sender's private key which will be S of hash of M and this will be sent to the receiver. So the receiver will have this message and the hash and also the signature signed by sender. Now the receiver can use S's public key and then using that it can decrypt this and get hash of M back and it can see that it was actually signed by the sender S and the receiver may further sign it in order to close the contract. Now suppose sender has a fraudulent message M dash also which he wants, the he wants to send to the receiver. Now he will find out the digest for this message H of M dash which is equal to H of M. So he needs the fraudulent message M dash and the actual message M which both has the same message digest hash of M. How this can happen is when we are forming the hash of a message see this is a message space which will be very large which we are compressing to a hash space now the hash space will be smaller than compared to the message space meaning 
there will be multiple messages here which has the same hash function so how a sender can find out m and m dash using which, which are having the same hash function is that so the sender will have a message m that said it will have a fraudulent message m dash and the, the sender will keep on trying to change a few letters here and there or it can change spaces he can add commas etc in m and m dash such that the meaning of both doesn't change but then on making each change the hash function will change as the message is changing the meaning is not changing but the message will change and the hash function will also change meaning he can keep on trying making small changes in m and m dash such that he will arrive at two messages m m dash such that both has the same hash function after he does this he will take this message and obtain the hash and sign it and then send it to the receiver now after the receiver also agrees to this message he can take the fraudulent message m dash and then get the hash and then sign it so this signature s of h of m dash and s of h of m will both be same because hash of message and hash of m dash the fraudulent message will be the same now at a later stage s can show that show this message and show that this is the hash of this message and then get the signature and show that this was a contract actually sent to the receiver at a later stage he can say that receiver signed the fraudulent message m dash instead of this m so this is birthday attack now let us look at the options one s can launch a birthday attack to replace m with a fraudulent message that's correct that's what i showed just now a third party attacker can launch a birthday attack to replace m with a fraudulent message and r can launch a birthday attack to replace m with a fraudulent message now for a birthday attack to take place clearly the signature part s of h of m has to be there but for in order to sign this we need to know ss private key only with the sender's private key can we sign the hash of a message and only once we have the signature we can decrypt it and show that a sender has actually signed a message for a third party attack or the receiver to get s to sign a different message obviously ss private key has to be known which a third party attacker or uh, the receiver doesn't have so the receiver or third party attacker cannot launch a birthday attack as they don't know ss private key so these two are false only one is correct so option b is the right answer the following functional dependencies hold true for the relational schema v w x y z v gives w v w gives x y gives v x y gives z which of the following is irreducible equivalent of this set of functional dependencies so this is a question from database management systems they are asking us about functional dependencies if you don't understand what functional dependencies are please refer to the video lectures for this topic so that you will gain a better understanding so in the question they are asking irreducible equivalent of this set meaning they are asking the minimal cover of this functional dependencies now how to find the minimal cover of functional dependencies that's explained clearly in the video lectures so for this question i will show you how to do it so first of all to find the minimal cover the first step is we need to write that functional dependency such that in the rhs there is only one attribute so the functional dependencies are v gives w v w gives x y gives v x we can split it as y gives v y gives x and the other one is y gives z which i have written here so in the second step we need to remove redundant functional dependencies from this set a redundant functional dependency is one which can be derived without that giving directly there so if you take a look here y gives x you can see that y gives v and v gives w and vw gives x y gives v v gives w v w gives x meaning y can give x indirectly through v without this functional dependency written here separately so y gives x is already covered and it is a redundant one which we can remove so, so if you look there are no more redundant functional dependencies here so after step 2 we will give we will get v gives w v w gives x y gives v and y gives z now in the third step we need to remove redundant attributes from a functional dependencies now a redundant attribute i will show you an example 
so if you take a look at this one vw gives x now this functional dependency says that v gives w so v gives w v and w together can give x so we don't need to write this w here this is redundant because v gives w already and w gives x meaning v alone can give x also which i have written here so we can remove w from this functional dependency so what we will get is v gives w v gives x y gives v and y gives z now we will look at the options here if you see option a is just directly what i have got here so option a is the correct answer option c was also a cover but it gives y gives x now y gives x just like just as i have shown here it is a redundant functional dependency so it is not an irreducible equivalent of this set now if you look at b and d you will see that it gives w gives x written straight now that is wrong w can never give x alone w and v together can give x from here we can remove w because v already gives w and v w together can give x that's why we could write it as v gives x instead of v w gives x so b and d is also wrong a is the right answer consider the following grammar p gives x q r s q gives y z or z r gives w or epsilon s gives y what is follow of q now this is a very straightforward question from first and follow that's from the compiler design topic so please refer to the video lectures for first and follow and, and understand how to solve such a question so for this one i will show you how to do this now we'll first we'll find out the first of all of these variables so first of p is p this is the only production first of p is same as first of this now first of this is x x is the a terminal symbol appearing at the start so we can write x directly here if you look at q q has two production q gives y z or z first will be y or z that's what i have written here now looking at r r gives w or r gives epsilon there are two production so the first of r would be w or epsilon it's written here s gives y directly s first of s will be y now we look at follow now to find follow we need to find wherever this symbol appears in the right hand side of productions first now the follow of the start symbol will always contain dollar to show that that's a terminating one so first of p p is the start symbol first of p will have dollar here p doesn't appear in the right sides of any production so we can just directly write dollar that's only terminal in the follow of p follow of q if you look q appears on the right hand side in this production now we need to see what appears on to the right side of q in this production to the right side of q it is rs so follow of q will be first of rs now first of rs is first of r is w we can write w here r contains epsilon also if r contains epsilon then we need to consider the first of whatever appears to the right side of r as well so since r contains epsilon and to the right side of r it's s we need to add the first of s also to this first of s is y so follow of q will contain w and y follow of r will be first of s that is y now first of follow of s s appears in the right hand side here now if there is a variable appearing at the end of a production like this whatever is in the follow of p we need to add it to the follow of that variable so since s appears at the right hand side here at the right end we need to add whatever is in follow of p to the follow of s so follow of p contains dollar so follow of s will contain dollar so this is the matrix here and follow of q is w comma y that was the answer threads of a process share a global variables but not heap b heap but not global variables c neither global variables nor heap d both global variables and heap so this is again a very straightforward question from operating systems regarding threads so i have drawn a diagram here to show what all is shared between multiple threads within the same process so each thread within a process will have its own local data now local data means its registers and stack so each process will have stack 
and registers each thread will have its own stack and registers now what is shared is that the entire code since all threads share the same code the data segment the data segment contains all the global variables etc declared here and the heap which is dynamically allocated and all the file descriptors of open files etc those will be shared among all the threads so from this clearly we can see that both global variables and heap is shared so d is the correct answer here let x be a gaussian random variable with mean zero and variance sigma square let y equals max of x comma zero where max of a comma b is the maximum of a and b the median of y equals to dash this is a question from probability distributions coming from engineering mathematics now this may seem like a complex question but it's actually a very simple question so here we have given that x is a gaussian distribution so the distribution of x is given as zero they have given mean is zero and variance is sigma square so the distribution of x will look like this the mean is zero so that's where the this bell shape icon the middle of the bell shape icon would be and variance is sigma square that data we don't need actually so this is how x looks and based on x we need to construct a new random variable y which is such that if y equal to max of x comma zero so if x is greater than zero y will be equal to x and if x is less than zero y will be equal to zero so this is the part where x is less than or equal to zero in all that part y would be equal to zero and when x is greater than zero y will be equal to x so we'll draw the graph of x just like that so this is the distribution for y and the question they have asked us the median median means the middlemost value so the median of this, this distribution is at zero there are equal number of x points to the left side of the y axis as there are x points to the right side of the y axis just like that here also there are equal number of points to the left side of the axis as to the right side of the axis the probability of taking a y less than 0 or greater than 0 is actually 0 0.5 0 0.5 so the median is again lie at the middle just as where it was here so the median point would be here that is 0 and that was the question which they asked so the answer is 0 if the question was mean or something then we would have had to calculate the area under this and got the answer so this is the correct answer let t be a tree with 10 vertices the sum of the degrees of all the vertices in t is dash this is a question from data structures regarding trees it's a very simple question so i'll show you how to answer this let's consider a tree with one vertex it will look like this now consider t with two vertices it will look like this consider t with uh, tree with three vertices it will be looking like this so if you see that on adding each vertex i will need to add exactly one edge which means that the number of edges in the tree equal to number of vertices minus one as the tree with only one vertex did not have any edges so number of edges equal to number of vertices minus one which means we have the question is given there are 10 vertices so that is 10 minus one equal to nine now each edge adds two to the sum of the degrees so if you see this sum of degrees is 2 because on the this side there is 1 and on this side there is 1 degree similarly if you look at this you will see it adds degrees here so each edge adds 2 to the sum of degrees meaning sum of degree equal to 2 into number of edges that is 9 into 2 that is equal to 18 18 is the answer consider the k-map given below where x represents don't care and blank represents 0 Assume for all inputs A, B, C, D, the respective complements A complement, B complement, C complement, D complement are also available. The above logic is implemented with two input nor gates only. Then minimum number of gates required is dash. So this is a question from K-maps from digital logic. Now K-maps are used to find the minimum product of sum or sum of product forms of a given expression. So we have been given the K-map for this expression. We need to find the minimum sum of product form of this expression and then to represent that expression how many two input nor gates are required that's what we need to find here so we'll try to minimize this so we need to find the largest prime implicance here so if you see one and one we can couple these two together but if you look to the left side of it you'll see that there is x and 
1 as well. X is don't care term. It, X can be 0 or 1. So we can combine these four together into one group. So this is the largest one to the top or down we have zeros only so we can't take those to combine. Now if you look here these are also don't care terms. We can combine these together. We can combine these four to form one expression but it's a don't care term. If we just give zero we will be eliminating just one essential one prime implicant altogether. So we don't need to do that. We can equate these x to zero and ignore those. So this is the minimum sum of product form of this k map. Now we will find out what this actually is. If you look the variable b changes from 0 to 1 here so b is not the one which we have to take here. a remains constant at 0 to 0 so we can write a complement. Now here d changes from 0 to 1 so d is not the one. c is constant c is 1 so we can write c. So what I have drawn here these four together this is a c. Now in the question they have asked to input NOR gates. What NOR gates do is on when we input A and B it will take A plus B the whole complement. So if we can write it as A plus B the whole complement form if you look using De Morgan's law we can apply and we can write it as A plus C complement the whole complement. A plus C complement the whole complement is A complement into C complement complement that is A complement C. So we can write it like this. This is what we can express using just one NOR gate. A and C complement input, we will get that. In the question it was given, complement forms are also available. That's why we could do it using just one gate. So the answer is 1. Consider the language L given by the regular expression A plus B star B A plus B over the alphabet A comma B. The smallest number of states needed in deterministic finite state automata DFA accepting L is. This is a question from finite automata section from theory of computation. So we have been given this language. We need to find out the minimal DFA accepting this language and we need to write the number of states in the minimal DFA. Now the minimal DFA for a regular language will be unique. So this answer will be a unique one. So we can try to solve this now. Now first I will draw the NFA for this language. It's given that the language is a plus B star. It starts with A plus B star. So that I will given as this. Initially for each A and B we remain the sta same state and then on seeing B we go to a next state and then A or B we go to the accepting state. So this is the NFA for this language. Now what this language does say is this language accepts all strings ending with B A or B B. So this is the language all strings ending with B A or B B. And this is the NFA for this language. We need to find the minimal DFA for this. Now there is a procedure for converting NFA to its corresponding minimal DFA. Now the procedure is given clearly in the video lectures finite automata section of theory of computation section. So you can refer to that video lectures to find out how the procedure works. But for this question I won't be using that procedure. I will be just looking at the language and I'll try to construct a DFA directly from here and find out the minimum states. So if you look here for this state for B I'm coming to this state as well as I'm going to the second state. So this we need to eliminate this part of NFA for the same B we are going to two states and also for these two for this state A and B it's going here for this state for A and B I haven't given any output that also I need to provide to convert to DFA. So let us start from here. Now as long as we see A's, it doesn't matter because it's a string ending with B or A. Only when we see the first B, uh, it matters. So let us say that for A, we go to the same state. And on seeing the first B, I go to this state. Now it's all string ending with B, A or B, B, right? So on seeing the next A or B, I can go to this state. Okay, so this seems correct. Now uh, from this state, I need to write transitions for input symbols A and B. 
so let us see that so if the next state is b there are two ways of reaching this state one is b a we saw b r a and now we are looking at b or the next is b or b we saw and reached this state and now we are looking at b now if this is the state if this is the case we'll see that the last two terminals are b b which is again the access, accepting state so on b i'll go to the same state only the same accepting state but if this was the case if we saw a b and then we saw an a and came to the state we'll see that on seeing the next b it is a b so that doesn't correspond to the accepting part it's ending in a b so that clearly we can't accept this so the state which we can go to is we can go to this state we saw one b so on, so that on seeing the next a or b i can accept so on b itself i need to go to either this state or this state depending on what i saw on arriving to this state so that what i saw on arriving to this state that i need to save i can't just write it in one state so we will split these states again let us say on a i came to this state non seeing b I'm coming to the state now we can try to draw transition symbols here for the state we have arrived at the state using b a now on seeing a the ending part will be a a using a a we can't take it to the state for the state we have to have seen a b previously so meaning that on a i need to go to the state only this a a so i'll go to this state only after seeing one b and one a or b only i can go to any of the accepting state this is this is the transition for a from this state now the transition for b is that if we have b a b i can still go to this state right i can go to this state on b on seeing the next a or b i can go to an accepting state so this is the transition for b for this state if it's b we reach this state from b b if we see one more b again it's again b b ending in an accepting configuration so on b i can go to the same accepting state on seeing a similarly i need to go to on seeing a what happens is we have seen b b already and now it is b a which is again an accepting state so on b a it's an accepting state but it won't be going back to this same state when we are accepting with b a it was this state so on seeing a i need to go to this state the state means we have already seen b a so far so this is the minimal dfa given the question you can verify the state i given transition for a and b this state i given transition for a and b this state i given transition for b a this state also i given transition for a and b so this is the minimal dfa for the language given here the number of states is 4 consider a database that has the relation schema emp employee id employee name department name an instance of the schema emp and a sql query on it are given below this is the table emp given here and we have been given a query as well select average of ec dot num from ec where department name num in select department name count emp id as ec department name num from emp group by department name so we have been given this table and this query on it and they are asking what the output would be so if you take a look at this query the query has two parts one is an outer query and then there is an inner select query so first we'll find out what the inner query does what the inner query does is select department name count of employee id as department name num the table return would have the name ec from employee from emp group by department name so this is a query on emp on which we do group by department name now if you look at the department name column you can see that there are five different department name aa ab ac ad and ae and this 
query will do group by department name on this and it will return count of employee id if you see all the employee ids are distinct so each one will add one to the count so we can try to find out what the output would be the output would have a schema like this department name and then num num will be count of employee ids that is the number of distinct employee id associated with each department name so for aa if you see there are four that is one two three four a b has three that is five six seven a c has three that is eight nine ten a d has two that is eleven twelve and a e has only one that is thirteen so the inner query will be returning this and this table we have named it as e c that's given here now let's look at the outer query what the outer query does is select average of e c dot num from e c where department name comma num in this outer query this outer query is ec only so they are asking us ec dot num average of ec dot num for all the rows in this table which is in ec ec is this table only so this part of the query where in does actually nothing further each of the rows will be in this itself so effectively the outer query what it does it would be it will be returning the average of this column that's the average of EC. Now the average is 4 plus 3 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 divided by 5 as there are 5 rows. That is 13 by 5 equal to 2.6. Consider the following CPU processes with arrival times in milliseconds and length of CPU bursts in milliseconds given below. There are 4 processes and their arrival times and burst times are given here. If the pre-MT shortest remaining time first scheduling algorithm is used to schedule the process, then the average waiting time across all processes is dash milliseconds. So this is a question from operating systems regarding process scheduling. They have given pre-MT shortest remaining time first scheduling algorithm and they are asking us to find what would be the average waiting time for all these processes. So let us draw this. So for each time quantum, let us see what happens. The arrival times of each process I have given here P1, P2, P3, P4. So let us see how it proceeds. So initially we have only P1 here. So we'll start running P1. After reaching 3, we'll see that P2 also has arrived. Now P1 has run for 3 milliseconds. There's a total burst time of 7 milliseconds. So the remaining is 4 milliseconds in P1 currently. Now P2 is also there. P2 has only 3 milliseconds remaining, which means according to the shortest remaining time first algorithm p2 will be chosen to run now there will be a context switch and p2 will be chosen since it's a preemptive shortest remaining time first algorithm so we'll start running p2 here after two time quantum we'll see that the process p3 arrives p3 has five milliseconds but p2 currently has only one millisecond remaining two it has already run total was three so only one millisecond is remaining so we'll keep on running P2, it will run for one more time quantum and P2 will be over by now. And by this time P4 also would have arrived. So we have 4 milliseconds remaining in P1, 5 milliseconds remaining in P3 and 2 milliseconds remaining in P4. So the shortest remaining time first algorithm will choose P4 now. So P4 will run for 2 time quantum and then it is over. From the rest, P1 has 4, P3 has 5. So P1 will be chosen. P1 will run for 4 more time quantum and p1 will be over and then p3 will run for five more time quantum so we'll find out the average wait time so for p1 p1 arrived at 0 and p1 got over at 12 out of that for seven time quantum it was a burst time of p1 so the waiting time of p1 is this is the completion time this is the arrival time so the and this is the burst time and waiting time is completion time minus arrival time the whole minus burst time that is 12 minus 0 minus 7 which is 5 similarly p2 was over at 6 it arrived at 3 and it had 3 time quantum as burst so the total waiting time is 6 minus 3 minus 3 equals 0 similarly for p3 p3 was completed at 17 it arrived at 5 and it had 5 milliseconds burst time so the total waiting time is 17 minus 5 minus 5 which is 7 for p4 it is 8 minus 6 minus 2 equals 0 which we did similarly so the waiting time for the average waiting time for the four processes 5 plus 0 plus 7 plus 0 by 4 which is 
12 by 4 equals 3. Consider a two-level cache hierarchy with L1 and L2 caches. An application incurs 1.4 memory access per instruction on average. For this application, the miss rate of L1 cache is 0.1. The L2 cache on average experiences 7 misses per 1000 instructions. The miss ratio of L2 expressed correctly two decimal places is dash. So this is a question for the caches coming in, coming in computer organization. So, it's a two-level cache hierarchy, meaning for every memory access, first we look in L1 cache and if it's not there, we'll go to L2 cache and if it's not there, we'll go to the main memory and access. So, here we need to find out the miss ratio of L2 cache. The miss ratio of L1 cache is given directly here. So, let's try to find out. Consider that there are 1000 instructions in total. And it's given that application gets 1.4 memory access per instruction. So, if there are 1000 memory instructions, 1000 instructions, it will cause 1.4 into 1000 memory accesses, meaning it will be causing 1400 memory accesses. And it's given that the miss ratio of L1 cache is 0.1, meaning for 0.9 of ratio of the memory accesses it will be there in L1 cache and for 0.1 memory accesses uh, it will not be there in L1 cache so 1400 into 0.1 equal to 140 so out of 1400 memory access coming to L1 140 won't be there in L1 the rest will be there in L1 so these 140 memory accesses will go to L2 cache now and for L2 cache, what they are given us is that it on average experiences 7 misses per 1000 instructions. So in the question, we started with 1000 instructions. Out of 1000 instructions, 140 memory access goes to L2. And out of this 140, it is said that 7 misses occur. 140 memory access go to L2 cache and out of that, 7 misses occur there. Meaning the miss ratio is 7 out of 140. That's equal to 0 0.05. This is the miss ratio for L2 cache. Let G equals V, comma E be any connected undirected edge weighted graph. The weights of the edges in E are positive and distinct. Consider the following statements. 1. The minimum spanning tree of G is always unique. 2. The shortest path between any two vertices in G is always unique. Which of the above statements is or are necessarily true? So this is a question from algorithms regarding minimum spanning trees and shortest path in a graph. And they are asking which of these two statements given here are always true. So the property of this graph is that it's a connected, undirected, edge weighted graph where the weights of the edges are positive and distinct. So when we have a graph with distinct edge weights, edge weights the minimum spanning tree of the graph will always be unique why that is so it's that if we consider the Kruskal's algorithm for minimum spanning tree in graphs what it does is it will sort the weights in the ascending order and it will choose sort the edges with according to their weights in ascending order and it will start choosing from the starting edge having the minimum weight so I have given one sample graph here so if you take a look at this graph all of the edges have distinct weights here so let's try Kruskal's algorithm and how it proceeds so all the edge weights are 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 so it will choose the minimum one first so it will choose this edge given by this red line here and after that it will choose this edge 2 given by this line here after that it will choose this edge that is 3 given this line here it won't choose 4 because it is connecting two vertices which is already in the minimum spanning tree it will choose this one five after that it will look at six it will choose this it will not take this edge because it's connecting two nodes already in the tree and it will after that it will choose this edge so the algorithm sorts the edges based on their weights and then picks up one by one from the start so if the edge weights are distinct this process will always give us a unique minimum spanning tree so you can say that the first statement is always true so this is correct second the shortest path between any two vertices of g is always unique now this is not true i have given one counter example here look at this graph with 
these four edges if i am looking at the shortest path between this vertex and this vertex you can see that this path has a weight of 1 plus 4 equals 5 this path also has a weight of 2 plus 3 equals 5 now this graph satisfies the conditions given here it's connected undirected edge weighted graph where all the weights are positive and distinct so clearly with this counter example we can say that the shortest path won't be unique we can always find another path we may be able to find another path having the same weight but the edges having different weight individually so this is not always true so the correct answer is a one only A multi-threaded program P executes with X number of threads and uses Y number of logs for ensuring mutual exclusion while operating on shared memory locations. All logs in the program are non-re-entrant, i.e. if a thread holds a log L, then it cannot reacquire log L without releasing it. If a thread is unable to acquire a log, it blocks until the log becomes available. The minimum value of X and the minimum value of Y together for which the execution of P can result in a deadlock are A X equals 1, Y equal to 2, X equal to 2, Y equals 1, C X equal to 2, Y equal to 2 and D X equals 1, Y equals 1. So this is a question from the deadlock section of operating system in which they are asking us about non reentrant locks. So this is a straightforward theory question. There are two kinds of logs which you need to know here. One is called re-entrant logs or recursive logs. The property of re-entrant logs is that suppose a thread is executing and it holds, acquires a log E and suppose it continues execution and comes back and tries to reacquire the log again. Now this log is already acquired by the thread. So when it tries to acquire the log E again, it sees that this current thread is the owner of this current lock and this thread has the lock already so it will allow this statement to pass through which means that this lock can be reacquired by the thread a lock can be reacquired by the owner of the thread again these are re-entrant locks the other kind is non-re-entrant locks or non-recursive locks the property here is that consider a thread that is executing it acquires the lock E which is non-re-entrant if it keeps on executing and tries to acquire the lock again now it will block here so this log is already with the thread but still it will block here because it's a non reentrant logs. So based on this we can try to answer the question. Here it's given that x number of threads are executing and there are y number of logs. They are asking the minimum number of threads and the minimum number of logs to cause a deadlock condition. So clearly one single thread and one single log itself can cause a deadlock if it's non reentrant log. So the answer is x equal to 1, y equal to 1. D is the answer. The value of limit x tends to 1, x raised to 7 minus 2 x raised to 5 plus 1 by x cube minus 3 x square plus 2 is 0, is minus 1, is 1, does not exist. So this is a question from limits in engineering mathematics. So in order to solve for this limit, first we will try by substituting x equal to 1. So when we give x equal to 1, we will get 1 minus 2 plus 1 by 1 minus 3 plus 2. That equals 0 by 0. Now this is in 0 by 0 form. When we get 0 by 0 form, that means that we can directly apply L hospital's rule for finding the answer. L hospital's rule means if we have something like limit x tend to c f of x by g of x, if this is in 0 by 0 or infinity by infinity form, then we can rewrite it as limit x tend to c f dash x by g dash x where f dash x and g dash x are derivatives of numerator and denominator respectively. So we will apply that here. We will take the derivative of numerator first. Derivative of numerator is x power 7 derivative is 7 x raised to 6 minus 2 into x raised to 5 derivative is 5 x raised to 4 divided by we will take the derivative of the denominator that is 3 x square minus 3 into 2x this will become 0 now we can again try applying x equal to 1 here now when we do that we will get 7 minus 10 divided by 3 minus 6 which is minus 3 by minus 3 equal to 1 now this is not in 0 by 0 or infinity by infinity form this is 1 and that's the right answer here so option is C 
let p q r be propositions and the expression p implies q implies r be a contradiction then the expression r implies p implies q is a tautology a contradiction always true when p is false always true when q is true so this is a question from propositional logic in which they have given us that p implies q implies r is a contradiction which means that p implies q implies r is false now p implies q implies r is false meaning there is only one possibility that p implies q is true and r is false if you write a implies b is false there is only one case that a is true and b is false this is the only case where a implies b becomes false so we know that p implies q is true and r is false p implies q is true meaning there can be three cases one is that p is true then q has to be true r is false if p is false then q can be true or false for p implies q to be true those two cases are p is false p is false q is false q is true and r is false always now for each of these three cases we'll write down this expression and we'll find what the value of that is r implies p implies q so p q r for each of these the values i have written here for the first case this expression will evaluate to false implies true implies true now false implies true that is true only as i said here a implies b is false only when this becomes true and this becomes false so false implies true implies true that evaluates to true implies true that is true only false implies false implies true now false implies false is also true now this becomes true implies false now that is false like i have written here false implies false implies true that becomes true implies true now that's also true so these are the possibilities for this expression given that this is a contradiction now we'll go through the options and see option a says that it's a tautology now that is false you can see that it becomes false for some case it's a contradiction that's also false there are values for which there is true here c always true when p is false in these three p is false in cases 2 and 3 but in cases 2 and 3 it is true and false both so option c saying that it's always true when p is false is also wrong now option d always true when q is true q is true in statements 1 and 3 in 1 and 3 it is true and true so option d is the correct answer it's always true when q is true so d is the correct answer here let u and v be two vectors in r square whose euclidean norms satisfy norm of u equals 2 times norm of v what is the value of alpha such that w equal to u plus alpha v bisects the angle between u and v so this is a question regarding vector spaces here they have given us two vectors here u and v so let's take one sample vector u so a vector will have a direction as well as an associated length of this arrow this length is what we call norm of the vector so here we have been given two vectors which satisfy this condition such that norm of u equal to 2 times norm of v that means the length of the arrow for u is twice the length of the arrow for v what is the value of alpha such that this vector w equal to u plus alpha v bisects the angle between u and v so let's take a sample example for this question and try solving this let's let us take that norm of v equals 1 which means the norm of u will be equal to 2 now what does norm of v equal to 1 mean for a vector belonging to r square r square is nothing but x y plane so norm of v equal to 1 meaning suppose the vector starting point is the origin 0 0 assume if the starting point is origin then vector v would be any of this vector with end point falling in this circle now any vector in this circle this arrow or this arrow this arrow anything would have the length as 1 meaning that the norm of that vector would be 1 so now we need to find a vector u u will have now we took v had we took that v had a norm of 1 meaning u will have a norm of 2 meaning if the starting point is the same if we take the starting point as origin the end point of u will fall within this circle of radius 2 
norm of u will be 2 here, norm of v will be 1 here. Now this particular example satisfies the question given here. Now we can take one sample u and one sample v of any angle to each other. Now for convenience I am taking that v is in 45 degree to this x line and u is in 45 degree to this x line in this direction, v is in this direction. So that the angle between these two is 90 degree. So we need to get w such that u plus alpha v bisects the angle between u and v. Now we know the angle between u and v is 90 degree. If w bisects it, w will fall at an angle of 45 degree with respect to u and v both. Meaning w will be falling on this y axis. w should be a vector of this format falling on the y axis. Now let us try adding v to u such that the endpoint will hit the y axis. So u goes on like this. v is in a direction of 45 degree to this baseline. If I take a sample vector like this, this is the direction of v. Now I am taking a sample vector of some length such that it has the same direction as v and that the endpoint will hit the y axis. Now whatever vector we got here, this is the valid w such that w equal to u plus some alpha into v. Now we need to find out what is alpha. Now if you take a look here, this is a triangle such that this angle is 45 degree. This angle is also 45 degree. This angle is also 45 degree. So making this also 45 degree. So this will be an isosceles triangle. So whatever is the length here, that will be the same length here. If that's the case, you had a length of 2, you had a norm of 2, meaning this vector which I have given in red will also have a norm of 2. Now this vector has the same direction as v but it has a different norm. Now v had a norm of 1, this vector has a norm of 2, meaning this is 2 times v since it had the same direction. So since this vector is 2 times v, we can safely write that u plus 2v equals w. Now this 2 is the alpha given here. So alpha equals 2. Now in this example I haven't solved this question completely. I have just taken one sample example and I solved it for that example and I found out that alpha is 2. But in gate they are asking this question. With, they have given us options that clearly option B, option C and option D are wrong for this question. So option A is the only correct one here. So option A is the right answer. For one example we proved that option B, C and D is wrong there. So whatever example we take these examples should be wrong there as well otherwise this question is wrong. They have asked this question meaning it has a unique answer. So even if it was a numerical type question, I could have taken one example like this and I have found out the answer. Because if the answer was different for some other example, then that question would have had multiple answers, which is not the case for gate questions. So this is the correct answer. Let A be an N by N real valued square matrix of rank 2 with sigma i equal to 1 to n, sigma j equal to 1 to n, a of ij square equals 50. Consider the following statements. One, one eigenvalue must be in closed interval minus 5, 5. Two, the eigenvalue with the largest magnitude must be strictly greater than 5. Which of the above statements about eigenvalues of a is necessarily correct? So this is a question regarding eigenvalues coming from linear algebra. Now. In this question, after we solve it, we will see that statement 1 is correct and statement 2 is false. Proving that statement 2 is false is very easy, but proving that statement 1 is correct is a lengthy process and there are multiple theorems which we need to know from linear algebra in order to answer this question. So this is a difficult question here. We will try to see how we can prove statement 1. So in statement 1, it is given that it is an n by n matrix. So 
let the eigenvalues be e1, e2, etc. up to en. Now it's given that the rank of matrix is 2, which means that n minus 2 eigenvalues must be 0. There will be only 2 eigenvalues which may be non zero, e1, e2, the rest of the eigenvalues of this matrix must be zero. Which are theorems you need to know in order to answer this question, I have underlined in red color. So you need to know this first. Now it's given that the matrix is symmetric. Okay. It's given that the matrix is symmetric, which implies that A is A transpose. So A into A transpose equals A into A, since A is symmetric which equals a square. So for this matrix a square, the eigenvalues are e1 square, e2 square and the rest would be zero. How we got this is for a matrix A, if the eigenvalues are e1, e2, etc. Then for the matrix a square, the eigenvalues would be the square of whatever were the eigenvalues of the original matrix A, meaning the eigenvalues would be e1 square, e2 square, etc. to zero. This also is a theorem which you need to know. Now, the sum of the eigenvalues here would be e1 square plus e2 square. Let's name this statement 1. We'll come back to this later. Now, consider a matrix of the form A, B, C, etc., D, E, F, G, H, I, etc. Let this be an n by n matrix. When we multiply this matrix with the transpose of this matrix, Transpose of this matrix is A, D, G, etc., B, E, H in the row, C, F, I, etc. to both sides. So when you multiply these two matrices, you will see that, let's multiply the first row with the first column. It would be A into A, A square plus B square plus C square, etc. throughout this row. That would be the first value here. Second and third, let's ignore. Fourth, let's ignore. The second row second element that would be d into d plus e into e plus f into f that is d square plus e square plus f square etc like this similarly the diagonal elements here would be the square of each of the elements here i'll repeat it when we take a matrix a and multiply it with a transpose the sum of the diagonal elements of a a transpose would be equal to the sum of the squares of each of the elements in A, which I have written as sigma i equal to 1 to n, sigma j equal to 1 to n, A of i j square equal to trace of A into A transpose. A into trace means sum of the diagonal elements. Now, A into A transpose is A square, since in the question it's given that the matrix was symmetric. So we can rewrite this as trace of A square. Now, trace of A matrix is the sum of the diagonal elements that will also be equal to the sum of the eigenvalues. So trace of a square we can rewrite as sum of the eigenvalues of a square. Now we will come back to statement 1. Sum of the eigenvalues of a square was e1 square plus e2 square. So here we have proven that sigma i equal to 1 to n, sigma j equal to 1 to n, a of ij square will be equal to e1 square plus e2 square. Now in the question it was given that sigma i equal to 1 to n, sigma j equal to 1 to n, a of ij square was 50. What that means is that e1 square plus e2 square equal to 50. Now e1 square plus e2 square equal to 50 means that at least 1 of e1 or e2 must be less than or equal to 5. If both are less than or equal, if both are greater than 5 then the sum of the squares would be greater than 50. So at least one eigenvalue, even e2 are eigenvalues of matrix A. So at least one eigenvalue must be in the closed interval minus 5 plus 5. So thus we have proven that statement 1 is true. So coming to statement 2, the eigenvalue with the largest magnitude must be strictly greater than 5. Now to disprove this it is pretty easy. Let's take the matrix 5, 0, 0, 5. Now sum of squares of this matrix is 5 into 5 is 25 plus 5 into 5 that is 50 which satisfies this condition. It's an n by n real valued square matrix. Rank is 2, 5, 0 and 0, 5 are independent vectors, independent vectors. So the rank is 2 here. So this matrix satisfies this condition. If I try to solve for the eigenvalues of this matrix, I will get that 5 minus lambda 0, 0, 5 minus lambda. The determinant of that would be 0 which means lambda would be 
5 comma 5. Now both the eigenvalues are 5 and 5. Now in the statement it's saying that eigenvalue with the largest magnitude must be strictly greater than 5. This is clearly wrong because both the eigenvalues here are less than or equal to 5. So this statement is false. Now we look at the options. Option B, one only, is the correct answer. A computer network uses polynomials over GF2 for error checking with 8 bits as information bits and uses x cube plus x plus 1 as the generator polynomial to generate the check bits. In this network, the message 01011011 is transmitted as and we have been given these options. So this is a question from computer networks regarding CRC. CRC stands for cyclic redundancy check. So CRC is a method used for error detection when a sender is sending a particular message to the receiver. So how it works is that there will be a number called CRC generator that is shared between the sender and receiver. So the sender uses this CRC generator and the message to be transmitted and based on that he will create some check bits known as CRC and the sender will append the check bits to the end of the message and then send it to the sender. Now sender will receive a particular message that will be the message plus the check bits appended to the end. Now the sender will start use the received message and the CRC generator and verify that the message has been sent without any errors. How the verification is done I will show you now. So, in this question, the CRC generator is given by the polynomial x cube plus x plus 1, which we can write as 1x cube plus 0x square plus 1x plus 1. So, the coefficients of the x term that is 1, 0, 1, 1. Now, this is the CRC generator. So, this number 1, 0, 1, 1, this will be known to both the sender and the receiver. Now, using this and the message to transmit, I'll show you how to generate the check bits. So, what we do here is that the CRC is 4 bits, CRC generator is 4 bits. Since it is 4 bits, we will be appending that minus 1 bits as zeros to the message. So, since it is 1, 0, 1, 1, that is 4 bits, we need to append 3 zeros to the end of the message. So, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 and we will append 3 zeros here. This process is done by the sender. Now, we will start x XORing this with the CRC generator until all the message bits become zero. So, I'll show you how to do it. The message is 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 3 zeros. We'll XOR it with 1, 0, 1, 1, this first four bits. What we get is 1 XOR 0 is 1, 1 XOR 0 is 1, 1 XOR 0 is 1. This becomes zero. Now, this bit is still one. We need to keep on doing this until all the message bits become zero. So we'll do the XOR again 1011. Now this becomes zero. This is one. This is zero. This is one. So we have made this bit zero. Now we need to keep on doing this until all this is zero. I'll do 1011 again. Now this becomes zero. All these four bits become zero. Now we can write the rest of the bits here. We already took five bits. The rest is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. We'll do XOR with 1, 0, 1, 1. This will be 0, 1, 1, 0. Again, we'll do XOR with 1, 0, 1, 1, which is 0, 1, 0, 1. Now, if you see all these, the first 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, the first 8 bits which was in the message, all that has become 0 now. Only in the last 3 bits, we have non zero numbers, and that is 1, 0, 1. This will be the check bit or CRC. Now, what the message, the sender will do is, he will append these three bits 101 to the original message and then send it to the receiver. So the message would be 10010110111101. If you look, that is option C. Now how the receiver will verify that the message has no errors is the receiver gets this message and just like how we did here, he will start doing XOR of this with the CRC generator. Now the CRC generator both the sender and the receiver knows. So the receiver will start XOR with the CRC generator on whatever message is received and at the end the receiver will see that everything will become zero including the last three bits. Now that means that the message has been transmitted without any error.
this is CRC. You can verify XORing this with 1, 0, 1, 1 and see that everything becomes 0. Consider a combination of T and D flip-flops connected as shown below. The output of the D flip-flop is connected to the input of the T flip-flop and the output of the T flip-flop is connected to the input of the D flip-flop. Now this sequential circuit diagram is given. They are telling that initially both Q0 and Q1 are set to 1 before the first clock cycle. The outputs are, in the question they are asking what the outputs are after the third cycle and the fourth cycle and four options are given we need to choose the correct option so this is a question from digital logic design regarding sequential circuits we have been given this sequential circuit consisting of t flip-flop and d flip-flop and we need to find out what the state would be after the third and fourth cycle so we'll see how to solve this so these are the characteristics of a t flip-flop and a d flip-flop for a t flip-flop if the input is 1 then after the next cycle it will perform a toggle operation that is whatever is stored in the t flip-flop it will be toggling so if it is 0 it will become 1 if it is 1 it will become 0 when the input is 1 if the input is 0 then it will just stay the same that is if the input is 0 if the t flip-flop is currently storing 0 then after the clock it will remain showing 0 and if it is storing 1 if the input is 0 it will keep on showing 1 only after the clock cycle Whereas for the D flip-flop, it will just pass through whatever is the input. If the input is 0, then after the clock, the output will become 0. If the input is 1, then after the clock, it will be storing 1 only. Now, let us see how it proceeds. So, there are two flip-flops given here. Each flip-flop can have state 0 or 1. Meaning for 2, there are 4 states. That is given as 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Now, for each of these, we will find out after one clock what would be the next value which I have given here as Q1 next and Q0 next showing after the clock what would be the next value for this. Now let's take a look at the circuit here. Now we can see that D flip-flops output is given to the input of T flip-flop. Before that see that T flip-flops output Q1 is given to the input of D flip-flop. So for D the input is Q1 meaning after every clock cycle whatever is Q1 that will become Q0 because D flip-flop after every clock it will just do a pass through of whatever is given as the input that will be stored in the D here meaning after every cycle Q0 will become equal to Q1 which we can write directly here. So Q0 next will be just Q1. So Q1 is 0 0 1 1 which I can just write straight here meaning after one cycle this 0 will become Q0 next so this I have just written directly here 0 0 1 1 now let's look at the T flip-flops input is Q0 so if Q0 is 0 Q1 will become Q1 will remain the same whatever is in Q1 that will be shown here and if Q0 is 1 whatever is in Q1 that will be toggled for Q1 next that I will show here. So, in these two states, Q0 is 0, meaning whatever is in Q1, that will become Q1 next. This I can write straight here, 0 and 1. And in these two cases, Q1, Q0 is 1, meaning we need to perform a toggle operation on whatever is in Q1. So, here it is 1. Now, we will toggle this, meaning Q1 next will become 1. Similarly, here Q1 is 1 and q0 is the input that is 1 so we'll toggle this meaning this will become 0 so these are the states how the states move from 1 to next for each of the possible configuration that is 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 these would be the next states so we'll draw the transition diagram and see how it proceeds suppose let us take the state 1 1 for 1 1 after one cycle it will become 0 1 that I have shown here for the state 1 1 after one cycle it will go to 0 1 similarly 0 1 will go to 1 0 which I have drawn here 1 0 will go to 1 1 and 0 0 will remain there only 0 0 itself as shown here so this is the state transition diagram you can see that if the state is any of these it will just cycle between these three and if the state initial state is 0 0 then it will just keep on showing 0 0 only now let's go to the question they are saying that before the first clock cycle it is set to 1 
so initially it will be 1 1 after 1 clock cycle it will be 0 1 after 2 clock cycle it will be 1 0 after 3 clock cycles it will be 1 1 and after 4 clock cycle it will become 0 1 as you can see here so the answer is 1 1 and 0 1 third cycle 1 1 fourth cycle 0 1 so the right answer is option B if G is a grammar with productions S gives S A S A S B B S A S S epsilon here A and B are the terminals where S is the start variable then which one of the following strings is not generated by G and we have been given these four options so this is a very simple question so one way to do this is that we can keep on trying generating multiple strings in this grammar and then we can try to generate these options given here and then whenever we generate one we'll eliminate that option and whichever we can't generate we'll give that as the answer but for this question i say it's very simple because if you look at this productions whenever a b is generated there is also an a getting generated here in this there is only one a getting generated here there is a b getting generated but simultaneously there is another a also getting generated here also if you see there is a b getting generated simultaneously there is an a also getting generated so whenever there is a b getting generated there will also be an a getting generated and here a can be generated independently which means that the number of a's in every string in this grammar would be greater than the number of b's in this grammar based on this information if you look at the options here you can see the number of a's and number of b's equals 2 here number of a is 3 b is 1 with a is greater than b number of a is 3 b is 2 a is greater than b but here if you see there are 3 b's and there are only 2 a's this will never happen because according to this grammar whenever a b is getting generated there will be a simultaneous a also which gets generated so we can straightforward say that d is the answer here without even trying to generate the strings here now from this we got the answer but i will show you how these strings are generated as well a b c so how to generate a b a b is s gives s and s that's from this production this s can give a s b that is this production s gives a s b same and this s and this s here goes to epsilon meaning we get a b a b similarly for a a a b we can follow this path and for C, A, B, B, A, A, you can follow this path, you can verify this for yourself and see that all those three are generated by this grammar. Only D won't be generated, so that's the answer. Consider the following two functions. They have given us two functions here, fun1 and fun2. The output printed when fun1 of 5 is called is, and four options have been given. This is a question from C programming section. So, let's take a look what happens when we call these two functions so if you look at fun one if you are calling it with some value of n now whenever n is zero it will return so the exit condition is that n becomes zero if n is non-zero it will immediately print n it will call fun two with n minus two value now the value if it is called with n minus two the value of n doesn't change in this function so it will print n once again the same value and then it will return so what it will do is if n is 0 it will return if n is non-zero it will print n call this function print n again and then exit now look at fun2 here also the exit condition is same if n is 0 it will return immediately if n is non-zero then it will print n it will call fun1 with plus plus n now it's doing plus plus n here meaning n is also getting incremented so if you are calling it with some non-zero n it will print n increment n by 1 call fun with that incremented value of n and then print that incremented value of n so it will be printing n here and it will printing n plus 1 here and it will be calling fun1 fun with value n plus 1 now let's look how it proceed when we call fun1 with value 5 so initially we are calling fun1 with value 5 so it will print 5 here it will be calling fun2 here which I have shown with these two diagrams we will be writing whatever is fun2 here after executing fun2 it will be printing 5 again so it will print 5 initially it will call fun2 and it will print whatever fun2 is printing after that at the end it will print 5 and then it will exit now let us see what happens when we are calling fun2 with value n minus 2 so since n was 5 here it will be calling fun2 with value 3 when we do that 
it will be printing 3 initially and then it will call fund 1 with plus plus n meaning this value of 3 is getting incremented so it will call fund 1 with value 4 after that n is also incremented so it will print that incremented value of n here which is 4 now so meaning initially we will start with fund 1 it will print 5 it will call fund 2 here it will print 3 now whatever is inside it will print whatever uh, is printed by fund 1 function when it is called that will be printed at the end it will print a 4 here it will come back to this fund 1 function it will print 5 and then it will exit now we can keep on writing it like this so from here it was calling fund 1 with value 4 it will print 4 call fund 2 with value 2 and then print 4 again it keeps on going here until we call fund 1 with value 2 here it will be calling fund 1 with value 2 it will call fund 2 with value n minus 2 that is 0 now when it is calling fund 2 with value 0 that is a return condition so at that point it won't be calling these functions anymore it will just return without printing anything and then it will come back and in the stack now all these functions are there it will keep on printing that final printf statement and all these numbers will be printed and then it will exit so starting it will print all these numbers in this order and then it will return from the inside function and then it will print all these function all these values in this order so the answer is 5 3 4 2 3 1 2 2 2 3 3 4 4 5 which is option a this is a question from c programming we have been given two functions here foo and bar and they are asking invocations of foo3 bar3 will result in which of these options given a it says it will return 6 and 6 respectively b it says foo will be infinite loop and bar will be abnormal termination c says foo will be abnormal termination bar will result in infinite loop and d says both will terminate abnormally now let's look at these functions and see what's happening here so first we look at foo we are invoking foo with 3 so here foo is invoked with 3 which meaning value equal to 3 value is 3 text is 0 while val greater than 0 that is true x equal to x plus foo of val minus minus so foo of val minus minus is called again but if you look here it's not pre decrement it is post decrement means foo of val will be used here and after that the value of val is decremented meaning effectively we will be calling foo of 3 only here that is we started with foo of 3 this is the stack i have shown here we call foo of 3 and then inside this we are calling foo of 3 again and only after calling foo of 3 we are decrementing the value of val to 2 so we will be calling foo of 3 again now that is the same thing happening again foo of 3 is called again that will keep on going through this it will come here it will call foo of 3 once again it is calling this now this keeps on going like this it will be calling foo of 3 again and again and all the while it h a new function is getting added to the stack here it was that this function calling this one without this one exiting and this is calling this this will keep on calling foo of 3 again and again meaning that stack will keep on growing like this now every computer has only a finite memory so this stack will run out eventually without none, none of the function will exit and it will keep on consuming the entire stack and then it will result in a stack overflow error it will be an abnormal termination so for foo it is abnormal termination now let's look at bar we are calling bar 3 now when we are calling bar with value 3 it will come here value is greater than 0 that's fine and then it will call bar of value minus 1 now unlike here it was calling value with the current it was calling foo with the current value and after that it was decrementing the value but here it is calling the function bar again with a decremented value so it will be calling bar here with val minus 1 that is val 2 that i will write here initially we are calling bar 3 we execute all this we reach here and it will call bar 2 same happens we will reach here again and it will call bar of 2 minus 1 that is bar 1 the same it goes on value is greater than 0 it will call bar of 1 minus 1 that is bar 0 now in 0 this condition is not true so we won't be entering this loop we'll just return this function so from bar 0 we'll return and come back to the function of bar 1 but if you look here we were calling bar with a decremented value bar of val minus 1 but we are not decreasing the value of val in this function anywhere we were calling bar with val minus 1 but 
val remains the same. So again it will come to this loop, it will see that val is greater than 0, val is 1 here now. It will see val is greater than 0 and it will execute this line again. That means it will initially we reach bar 1, it will call bar 0, bar 0 will return and come back to bar 1. But bar 1 will call bar 0 again and it will come back, it will call this again, it will come back, it will call this again. This keeps on happening since the value of val is not changing in this function. So this is nothing but an infinite loop. This bar 1 keeps on calling bar 0 and it will come back and keeps on calling this. Now if you look here, the memory consumed doesn't change. In the stack it grows up to here, after bar 0 it will remove bar 0 from stack and only after that it will come back to bar 1, where again it will call bar 0. So that's added to stack but this part, it, the stack doesn't grow beyond this point. The stack grows only up to this point. So there won't be any overflow happening here but this is an infinite loop. Bar 1 keeps on calling bar 0 and comes back. So this will result in an infinite loop. So the answer is first one is abnormal termination, second is infinite loop. That is option C here. Consider the context free grammars over the alphabet A, B, C given below. S and T are non terminals. G1 gives S gives A, S, B or T. T gives C, T or epsilon. G2 is S gives B, S, A or T. T gives C, T or epsilon. The language L of G1 intersection L of G2 is and these four options are given. So we have been given two grammars here G1 and G2 and we need to take the intersection of these grammars and find out what the final language is. So this is a question from theory of computation regarding uh, grammars, regular grammar, context free grammar etc. So we will look at these two grammars and try to gain more intuition into this as to what these grammars are and then we will take the intersection of it. So let's look at G1. G1 says that it gives S gives A, S, B or T. So in this part there is one more S. So we can keep on taking this part S gives A, S, B and this S we can keep on resolving it to A, S, B etc. until we resolve this S to a T. Now once we do that there is no more S and then T we can generate independently here T gives C, T independent of S I mean T gives C, T or epsilon. So this part will be C star. If you see T can be epsilon, T can be 1C and T which can be again 1C and T etc. So this is C star, 0 or more C's. Similarly if you take a look at G2 this is generating B, S, A. We will keep on generating B, S, A until we gen, uh, resolve S to T and after that T will be C star only. So G1 will look like this A raised to N, C raised to M, B raised to N such that N, M greater than or equal to 0. If you look here it is generating equal number of A's and B's, A to the left, B's to the right. It will keep on generating it like that until we reach 1T. That T will be C star. That is what I have written here. N number of A's then, then any number of C's and then N number of B's. E number of A's and B's would be equal. Similarly G2 we can write as N number of B's then M number of C's and then N number of A's. Nm is greater than or equal to 0 in both the cases. Now G1 generates two types of strings here. If n is greater than 0, it generates strings starting with a. And if n is equal to 0, n is this part. If n is equal to 0, it will generate c star, that is 0 or more c's. Similarly, in G2, if n is greater than 0, it generates strings that start with b. And if n is equal to 0, it will generate c star. So if you see, for n greater than 0 strings starting with A, there is not even a single string in G2 starting with B. So G1 intersection G2 will eliminate all of these strings. Similarly for G2, if n is greater than 0, it starts with B. There is not a single string in G1 that starts with B. So taking intersection, all of these strings will also be eliminated. Meaning only these two strings will be left. If n is 0, it is C star. If n is 0, it is C star here. So intersection will generate uh, these two are equal here. So intersection of language of G1 and language of G2 will be giving us this part only that is C star. So L of G1 intersection L of G2 equal to C star. Now C star is a regular language but it is not finite. So the answer is B not finite but regular. Consider the following languages over the alphabet. Sigma equal to A, B, C. 
let L1 equal to A raise to N, B raise to N, C raise to M such that M N greater than or equal to 0 and L2 equal to A power M, B power N, C power N such that M N greater than or equal to 0. Which of the following are context free languages? We have two options L1 union L2 and L1 intersection L2. So they have given us two context free languages here L1 and L2 and they are asking which of these are context free if we take union or intersection of these which of these are also context free languages so let's go to statement one l1 union l2 now two context free languages are always closed under union so the reason for that is i'll show you the proof for that let us say for each language l1 and l2 we can write the gra corresponding grammar for it suppose s1 is the starting symbol for the first grammar and S2 is the starting symbol for the second grammar, let us suppose. Meaning the first grammar will look something like S1 gives something, etc. And the number of productions here. Similarly, S2 will also look like S2 gives something and some productions here. This is the grammars for the language L1 and L2. Now, if I try to create a new grammar S such that S gives S1 or S2. S1 gives whatever were here. S2 gives whatever we're here and all the productions here. If you take a look at this, this is also a context free grammar. It satisfies all the rules for a context free grammar. As well as this generates a union of S1 and S2. S initially gives either S1 or S2 and S1 will give all the strings in S1. S2 will give all the strings in S2. So this is showing that union of two context free grammars are also context free. So this part one is true. Context free languages are closed under union. Now, second is intersection. Context free languages are not closed under intersection. If we take the intersection of two context free languages, the resulting one may or may not be context free. It is not guaranteed that the intersection is context free. So, we will take this example and take the intersection and see if it is actually context free or not. So, L1 is A power N, B power N, C power N, meaning the number of A's and B's should be equal and then there will be a number of C's after that. So L1 is a set of all strings of A's, B's, C's such that number of A's equal to number of B's. L2 is a set of all strings A's, B's, C's such that number of B's equal to number of C's. Now intersection of these two will be the set of strings that belong to L1 and L2 both. Meaning that for any string belonging to L1 intersection L2 the number of A's should be equal to the number of B's to satisfy L1. Also the number of B's should be equal to the number of C's in order to satisfy L2's condition. That's what I have written here. So what it implies is that the number of A's should be equal to the number of B's and number of B's should be equal to the number of C's meaning number of A's, B's and C's, or C's all should be equal to each other. Meaning L1, L2, L1 intersection L2 is nothing but A power N, B power N, C power N such that N is greater than or equal to 0. All should be equal to each other. Now this is not a context free language, this is a context sensitive language. The proof of that you can look in the video lectures and see that even if I keep on pushing A's then for when I see B's for the push down automata for this language I can keep on pushing A's and when I see I can either pop A's or push B's but then again for C also I have to equate it to A and B. So this I can't do it via a push down automata using a single stack. You can see the proof if you refer to the video lectures for context sensitive languages section. So this is a context sensitive language, it's not context free. So L1 inter intersection L2 is not a context free language. Meaning the right answer is option A statement 1 only. Let A and B be finite alphabets and let hash be a symbol outside both A and B. Let f be a total function from a star to b star. We say f is computable if there exists a Turing machine which gives, which given an input x in a star always holds with f of x on its tape. Let lf denote the language x hash f of x such that x belongs to a star. Which of the following statements is true? a f is computable if and only if lf is recursive. b f is computable if and only if lf is recursive enumerable. C. If f is computable, then lf is recursive but not conversely. And D. If f is computable, then lf is recursive enumerable but not conversely. So this is a question from theory of computation regarding halting Turing machines and computability and recursive, recursive enumerable languages, etc. All these concepts. So in the question, what they have given us is that there are two finite alphabets 
a and b a and b contain a finite set of alphabets and then hash is a symbol outside both a and b then then we have been given a function f from a star to b star which means that given any string belonging to a star this function will give us the corresponding string in b star which is the function of that string now we say f is computable if there exists a turing machine which given an input x in a star always holds with f of x on its tape now we say that the function f is computable if there is a halting turing machine to which we give an x belong to a star as input and then it will halt and give us the output which is f of x belonging to b star for that if there is a turing machine existing like that which can calculate f of x to any x given we say that the function is computable and they have also given us another language lf denoting the language x hash f of x such that x belongs to a star now lf is a language which contains strings of this form such that x belongs to a star and then there is a hash and after that the f of x part appears f of x belongs to b star now they are asking which of the following statements is true regarding computability of the function and then recursive or recursive enumerable nature of lf so let's start with the assumption that f is computable let's say f is computable if that's the case from definition we know that there is a halting turing machine which can produce f of x on input x meaning that if f is computable there is a turing machine to which we can input x and then which will output f of x to us so we can calculate f of x easily now given any string of the form s1 hash s2 now here i have outlined an algorithm what this algorithm does is that if we input any string of this form first verify that s1 belongs to a star this part should belong to a star this a turing machine can do easily a halting turing machine can do that second is verify s2 belongs to a star that's also similar that's also an easy part and then calculate the string s3 which is equal to f of s1 now we know s1 belongs to a star that's what we have verified here now s1 is a string belonging to a star and we know that the function f is computable meaning we can give the string s1 to this turing machine that computes f and then it will give us an output which will be f of s1 so we can input s to this turing machine and we can get the function f of s1 and let us call this string s3 now check if s3 is equal to s2 the string we got f of s1 compare it with s2 and check if both are equal if both are equal then we can say that s1 hash s2 belongs to the language lf given here because that's by definition s1 belongs to a star then hash then s2 belongs to b star f of x which is f of s1 so clearly we can say that s1 hash s2 belongs to lf if no then s1 hash s2 does not belong to lf that's by definition so what is this algorithm what does it do this is nothing but a halting turing machine that accepts lf for any string belonging to lf if we input that to this turing machine then it will halt and accept if it doesn't if it doesn't belong to lf it will halt and it will say it doesn't belong it will reject so if f is computable i have given you a halting turing machine that accepts any string belonging to lf which meaning that lf is recursive if you have a halting turing machine that accepts lf then lf is recursive meaning i have just proved that if f is computable then lf is recursive now we will go to the other part and the other part says that suppose lf is recursive if lf is recursive it means that the turing machine for lf holds for all inputs of the form s1 hash s2 and it will accept if s1 belongs to a star s2 belongs to b star and f of s1 equal to s2 and it will reject otherwise what are given in these two steps is that that's just the definition of this language lf is recursive meaning if there is input any string if it's of the form s x hash f of x then it will accept otherwise it will reject now for any x belongs to a star for which we need to compute f of x we can input x hash s1 x hash s2 x hash s3 etc to this turing machine until we get a string s x hash s of x that is accepted by the turing machine what i'm saying here is that 
we know LF is recursive for any language belonging to LF we have a Turing machine that will halt and say if it is belonging to LF or if it doesn't belong to LF now we want to see if the function f is computable for that for the function to be computable whatever x is given we need to find out f of x belong belong to this function right so suppose we have a sample x belong to a star for which we need to compute f of x what we'll do is to this halting turing machine for lf i will just input x hash s1 x hash s2 x hash s3 etc until this turing machine will halt and say it will it is accepting that string so what is s1 s2 and s3 s1 s2 and s3 are nothing but all the strings in language b star which i have written in an increasing order so let us say b star equal to let us say b equal to a comma b then b star will be equal to epsilon a b these are the strings of length one then there will be a a a b b a b b these are strings of length two so in a way we have an ordering in b star so these are the strings s1 s2 s3 s4 x5 s4, etc so all these strings i will input to this turing machine now it is guaranteed that after a point so most of every one of these strings won't belong to lf it will halt and say it doesn't belong to lf until we get one language for which it will halt and say it belongs to lf now why that is true is that it is guaranteed to return an accepting string because f is a total function i.e for every x there is an f of x that exists which we can rephrase it in this form that there is a string x hash f of x belonging to lf so in this procedure we are keeping on inputting x hash and every string in b star for every x since it is a total function they have already given there is at least one string sx belonging to b star that is nothing but f of x now that string will belong to lf so that this turing machine will halt and say yes this string belongs to lf that's what i have given here meaning it after a while of doing this this turing machine will halt and give us a string x hash sx that turing machine will say that yes this string belongs to language lf at that point we can stop now what is this string that this turing machine say it accepts take the accepting string x hash s of x s of x is sx is nothing but f of x if this string belongs to lf it means that sx should be equal to f of x i.e we have just computed f of x so i've just given you an algorithm if lf is recursive using this algorithm we can calculate f of x for any x given which means that if l of s is recursive f of x is computable so we have proven two things here one is that if f is computable lf is recursive second is lf is recursive f is computable meaning option a is the correct answer f is computable if and only if lf is recursive recall that bellardi's anomaly is the page fault rate may increase as the number of allocated frames increases now consider the following statements s1 random page replacement algorithm suffers from bellardi's anomaly and s2 LRU page replacement algorithm suffers from Bellardi's anomaly. Which of the following statements are correct regarding the truth of these statements? So, this is a question from operating systems from page replacement algorithm sections. They are asking us about Bellardi's anomaly. Now, Bellardi's anomaly states that the page fault rate may increase on increasing the number of allocated frames. So, please refer to the video lectures for page replacement algorithm section and learn about Bellardi's anomaly if you don't know about those. So, this anomaly occurs in non-stack algorithms. Non-stack algorithms are those which does not follow stack property. Now, those algorithms are FIFO, second chance, second chance algorithm, etc. So, what is stack property? Stack property states that pages of M is a subset of pages of M plus 1. What I have written here is that pages present in memory at each point when M frames are available it's a subset of pages present in memory when m plus 1 pages are available. So, this is a stack property. Algorithms such as LRU follow stack property. So, Bellardi's anomaly doesn't occur there. Whereas, algos such as first in first out doesn't follow this property. So, Bellardi's anomaly will occur there. 
So let's look at S2. LRU page replacements algorithm suffers from Bellady's anomaly. Now this is false. S1 a random page replacement algorithm suffers from Bellady's anomaly. Now for random page replacement algorithm the page replacement can happen in any fashion. Meaning there can be cases when the random page replacement algorithm follows just like first in first out algorithm only. Random can be anything so it can become first in first out also. If it becomes first in first out then clearly it will suffer from Bellady's anomaly. So random page replacement algorithm may suffer from Bellady's anomaly. Which means that S1 is true and S2 is false. So B is the right answer. Consider a database that has the relation schemas EMP, EMP ID, employee name, department ID and department, department name, department ID. Note that the department ID can be permitted to be a null in the relation EMP. Consider the following queries on the database expressed in couple relational calculus. Now we have three tuple relational calculus queries given here and they are asking which of the queries above are safe. So in tuple relational calculus, this is a question for relational algebra from DBMS first of all. It's asking us about tuple relational calculus. In tuple relational calculus, safe queries are those which returns a finite number of tuples and unsafe queries are those which may return an infinite number of tuples. So I'll show you an example of an unsafe query. Let us say we are saying that set of four elements T such that T does not belong to EMB. Now here the only condition is that it needs to return tuple that does not belongs to this table EMP. Now that condition can be satisfied by L, an infinite number of tuples in the universe. It's just saying that T does not belong to EMB. T may come from department, T may come from somewhere else. So this is not a finite set. Instead, if the query was set of elements T such that T belongs to EMP, then it would have been a finite set and that would have been a safe query. Because if I say T belongs to EMP, then I just need to return only the tuples in the EMP table. So now that you know what safe and unsafe queries are, let us look at these three queries here. Now if you look at the query, you will see that the part before and in all these queries is just the same thing. It says that set of elements T such that there exists U belonging to EMP such that T of EMP name equals to U of EMP name. Now that's the same for each of the three queries before the AND part. So what it does is it, relates, it returns all the tuples T such that there is some tuple U belonging to, belonging to EMP such that T's EMP name and U's employee name is the same. Now clearly that is a finite set. Set of all U's such that set of all u's belong to emp will be a finite set here now set of all t which has a name that is equal to some u will also be a finite set due to that now we can say that this part is returns a finite number of tuples so this part is safe for all three for one two and three first the part before and returns finite number of tuple Okay, now let's look at the part after AND. Now after AND, for the first query, it says that for all B belong to department, T's department name not equal to V's department name. Now it is saying it needs to return the set of all tuples T such that it does not have a department ID that is equal to some tuple V in department ID. So this is similar to this query which I have written here. It is a set of all T's which has a department name that is not equal to the department name of V. Now that may return an infinite number of tuples. It's not a finite set. It's just saying it's not equal to something in here. So this would be return an infinite set. Now the query is this part and this part. So this part will be true for only a finite number of tuples T. And this part will be true for and it may be true for an infinite number of tuples t but this is finite and we have an and expression between those so this is true for a finite number of tuples this may be true for infinite number of tuples but when we are applying and it will become true for only a finite number of tuples see finite number of tuples and infinite number of tuples so both will be true for only a finite number of tuples meaning this is safe since finite and infinite would be finite only so one is safe now let's look at two after the end part it says set of all 
there exists v belong to department such that t of department id is not equal to v of department id again this is also just like the previous one here here the thing was it was for all v and here it is there exists v but they are saying here is that there is at least one v in department which does not have the department id same as v so this part returns i'll repeat again this part returns tuples t such that it there is at least one v belong to department which doesn't have a same department id as t now this also again may return an infinite number of tuples so this also i can write as infinite number it will be true for infinite number of t's but then again it is a finite number of t's and true for an infinite number of t's so meaning the and of these two will be true for only a finite number of tuples t coming to third one the part after and is there exists v belongs to department such that t of department id equals v of department id huh. so it is saying the set of all tuples t such that it has a department id which is equal to some v in department id the department id of some v belong to department now this query is just like this query this will also be true only for a finite number of t's it won't be true for infinite number of t's so this we can write as finite meaning this part is true for a finite number of t's and this part is true for a finite number of t's so and of these two will clearly be true for only a finite number of t's tuples t so this is also a safe query now from the options you can see that d is the correct answer there is this is the meaning of all the three queries i have written here in the intuitive meaning of the first query is employees who do not belong to any department the second one is employees who do not belong to some department third one was employees who do not belong who belongs to some department this was employees who do not belong to some department employees who belong to some department all of these queries employees is the condition it should be true for some employee belong to and and this condition since employee is a finite set all these three sets would also be finite so these three are safe in a database system unique timestamps are assigned to each transaction using lamport's logical clock let transaction t1 and timestamp of t1 and timestamp of t2 be the timestamps of transactions t1 and t2 respectively besides t1 holds a lock on the resource r and t2 has requested a conflicting lock on the same resource r the following algorithm is used to prevent deadlocks in the database system assuming that a transaction assuming that a kill transaction is restarted with the same timestamp so this is the algorithm if timestamp of t2 is less than timestamp of t1 then t1 is killed else t2 waits now assume any transaction that is not killed terminates eventually which of the following is true about the database system that uses the above algorithm to prevent the deadlocks options are the database system is both deadlock free and starvation free option b the system is deadlock free but not starvation free option c the system is starvation free but not deadlock free option d neither deadlock free nor starvation free so this is a question coming from dbms section regarding timestamp ordering and deadlocks so in this question they have given that unique timestamps are assigned to each transaction using lamport's logical clock which means that each transaction happening will be having a unique timestamp and since they have said lamport's logical clock which means the timestamps will be assigned in the increasing order only if a transaction b comes after transaction a then a will have a smaller timestamp and b will have a larger timestamp now they have given that t1 holds a lock on the resource r and t2 has requested a conflicting lock on the same resource r now consider these two transactions t1 and t2 currently t1 has the lock and t2 is requesting a conflicting conflicting lock on the same resource r which t1 has now they will check this if timestamp of t2 t2 is requesting the lock is less than timestamp of t1 t1 is a transaction which has a lock so if timestamp of t2 is less than timestamp of t1 then the process t1 would be killed otherwise the process t2 will have to wait till t1 finishes execution and also they have given that any transaction that is not killed will terminate eventually so if you take a look at this 
it is somewhat like the transaction which has a smaller timestamp has the higher priority here if the timestamp that has a smaller if the transaction that has a smaller timestamp is requesting a lock which is held by a transaction that has a higher timestamp suppose t1 in that case the process which has the lock and the higher timestamp that one would be killed otherwise that transaction would be waiting meaning it's kind of like the transaction which has the smaller timestamp will be having a higher priority and if that request a lock held by a lower priority transaction the lower priority one would be killed otherwise if a transaction is requesting a lock held by a another transaction which has a lower timestamp or a higher priority then that transaction will have to wait the other one won't be killed so let us look here this is the condition for deadlock in the question they have asked us about deadlock and starvation okay so when does deadlock happen suppose two transactions consider two transaction a and b a has this resource b has this resource and b wants this resource and a wants this resource this is kind of a circular wait a and b is waiting for a resource held by each other now this is the case for deadlock right but in this question suppose the transactions let these be the transaction 1 2 3 4 5 6 etc which came in this order meaning they will have the timestamps in some increasing order unique timestamps in some increasing order suppose 2 5 6 7 9 10 etc these be the timestamps now if you look this a and b here they will have different timestamps right a and b always has different timestamps meaning one of the process will be having kind of that higher priority which we discussed earlier meaning whichever timestamp whichever of a or b has the lower timestamp let us say a's timestamp was 5 and b's timestamp was 2 imagine so a is requesting a resource which is held by b and a has a higher timestamp in that case a will have to wait nothing will happen which is given in this algorithm here but at the same time b is requesting a resource held by a correct but b has a timestamp smaller than a in that case what happened a will get killed just like in that algorithm given here when a is killed all the logs obtained by a would be released and b will get that lock and b can continue running which means deadlock can never happen in the question it's clearly given everyone has unique timestamp meaning there would be at least one process which has the smallest timestamp or the highest priority here similarly whenever two process or two or more process are considered one will always have the smallest timestamp so that process can kill all the other process and obtain the logs from them so a deadlock will never occur in this scenario so this is deadlock free now let's look at starvation okay let us say this transaction 3 has a lock imagine and let us say 2 is requesting the same lock in that case 3 will be killed and then 2 will continue running now 2 has the lock okay now imagine 1 is also requesting the same from 2 1 has a smaller time stamp so 2 will also be killed and 1 will obtain the locks which was held by 2 and 1 will continue to run and there is no one else who can kill run kill 1 because 1 has the lowest timestamp here so 1 will keep on running so the processes which are killed right they will be restarted 2 and 3 but when they are getting restarted they will start with the same timestamp which they had previously 5 and 6 they won't be starting with some timestamp at a later later stage like they won't be starting with the timestamp greater than 10 or something they will start with the same timestamps only this was given here in the question a killed transaction is restarted with the same timestamp now two or three will be restarted they will have to reacquire the logs which they previously had but the condition for starvation is one process having to wait for a log indefinitely without knowing when it will get that is the case for starvation but if you see here 2 and 3 are restarted now 1 will eventually finish its execution so in this list again 2 is the one with the smallest timestamp here after 1 finishes running so there is no one else who can exclude 
who can kill two there is no other transaction which can kill two now two is kind of like having the highest priority in this list now and whenever two wants a lock two will get that lock because two can kill any other process here similarly after two is done three will be able to kill any process coming back here coming at a later stage meaning that they won't be denied lock indefinitely there will be a time after which they will definitely get their lock that is whenever all the process before it has finished running so a newer process coming won't be having a timestamp before two or three meaning when whenever a process is assigned a timestamp whenever all the process running before it is finished that process will definitely able to acquire all the locks it needs so this will also never cause starvation meaning there will never be starvation so that this logic is deadlock free as well as starvation free sorry so the option is system is both deadlock free and starvation free option a is the right answer consider the following grammar statement if expression then expression else expression semicolon statement or o expression gives term relational operator term or term term gives id or number id gives a or b or c number gives 0 to 9 so in this grammar the ones i have underlined in red are the variables and the ones i haven't like these are the terminals the ones which are not underlined in red are terminals consider a program p following the above grammar containing 10 if terminals the number of control flow paths in p is dash and they have also given an example program if e1 then e2 else e3 if that's the program it has two paths that is take e1 then e2 or e1 and then e3 this correspond to the condition being true the expression being true and then taking this part and this corresponds to the expression being false and then taking this part e3 so we have been told that there are 10 if terminals we have to find out the number of control flow paths in p so this is a question from compiler design regarding parser this is the program and they want to know they want us to answer how many control flow paths can be there in a program that contains 10 if expressions so let's take a look at this grammar it says a statement generates an if expression like this if expression then expression else expression once this is generated let's see what expression will give us expression will give us term relational operator term or term term can give us id or number id gives a or b or c number gives 0 or 9 so in each step a variable can only produce variables below variables from productions below this grammar so expression if i have a variable expression somewhere while i was generating uh, the strings in the grammar suppose i have expression now expression can only generate term variables inside this expression can never go back to statement here only if we reach statement we will get an if condition because if is generated by this variable statement if we got an expression it will only generate terms if we have terms it can only generate id or number it can't generate expression or statement id can only generate three terminals number will also generate only three terminals so what it means is that if i have something like if expression then expression else expression i have something like this these are the variables expression three expression variables expression can never generate a statement from this point onwards meaning that there won't be further ifs within this expressions these expressions which effectively means that if the grammar has 10 ifs there's only one way to get that that is statement generates if then else statement now this statement will again generate if then else statement again this statement will generate if then else like that 10 times so this program what does it mean this program is like 10 lines if then else there will be expressions in between expression 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 similarly we have 10 like lines like this and then at the end this is an empty statement oh dot was empty statement that was given in the question but i just didn't write it because the text was large so our program looks like this now the first statement can take two paths that is let us say if e1 then e2 else e3 
can be e can take e1 e2 or e1 e3 this was given in the question itself if it's if e1 then e2 else e3 there are two control flow paths so statement one will have two control flow paths similarly this will also have two control flow paths etc the last one will also have two control flow paths so there are 10 statements each with two control flow paths so the number of total number of control flow control flow paths would be 2 into 2 into etc up to this that is there are 10 statements which is nothing but 2 raised to 10 that is 1024 1024 was the answer to this question In a RSA crypto system, a participant A uses two prime numbers P equal to 13 and Q equal to 17 to generate her public and private keys. If the public key of A is 35, then private key of A is dash. So this is a straightforward question coming from RSA crypto systems that is from computer networks. If you don't understand RSA, please learn the algorithm first. I am just applying the algorithm straight and then finding out the answer here. So, Let's see how that works. It's given that P equals 13 and Q equal to 17. These two are two prime numbers. And E equal to 35, that's the public key used by A. And D, we need to find out which would be the private key of A. So the RSA algorithm states that in the step one, we need to find out N such that N equal to P into Q. So P into Q is 13 into 17, that is 221. In step two, we find out phi of N phi of n is p minus 1 into q minus 1 that is equal to 12 into 16 that is 192 now in step 3 we need to find we need to assign public key and private key public key is given already now we need to find out private key so the relation between public key and private key would be that d into e mod phi of n would be equal to 1 or in other words d into e congruent 1 mod phi of n d we don't know e we know so that is d into 35 congruent 1 mod phi of n now we need to find out d such that when it multiplied with 35 and when we take the modulus of that with respect to 192 we should get 1 so i return the table down here for that i'm changing d from 1 to etc increasing and d's value is uh, d's value i'm increasing and e is 35 which remains constant so in each step i will be doing d into 35 and then i will be taking mod of that with respect to 192 so we, when d is 1 d into 35 is 35 mod 192 is 35 which i keep on writing like this until i get mod 1 so if you see when i do when i put d equal to 11 d 11 into 35 is 385 mod 192 is 1 now we got the correct answer d will be equal to 11 11 is the private key The value of the parameters for the stop and wait ARQ protocol are as given below. Bitrate of transmission channel equals to 1 Mbps. Propagation delay from sender to receiver equals 0.75 milliseconds. Time to process a frame equals 0.25 milliseconds. Number of bytes in information frame equals 1980. Number of bytes in acknowledgement frame equals 20. Number of overhead bytes in the information frame equals 20. Assume that there are no transmission errors. Then the transmission efficiency expressed in percentage of the stop and wait ARQ protocol for the above parameters is. So this is a question from computer networks regarding stop and wait protocol. If you don't understand stop and wait protocol, please refer to the video lectures for the same from computer networks section and then you can come back and answer this. So here for the given stop and wait protocol, all these parameters have been given and they are asking us to calculate the efficiency. So we will see how to do that. So here I have given the entire messages which gets passed and we need to find out the efficiency. So initially the information packet needs to be transmitted which is given by T transmission given here. After that the packet needs to travel from sender. This is receiver. From sender to receiver we need to add the propagation delay for the packet to travel through the medium from sender to receiver. At the receiver, there will be some processing delay added. And after that, there will be an acknowledgement frame which the sender will send back, which the receiver will send back to the sender. So the acknowledgement frame will also have a transmission time, which are given as T transmission for ACK. And the acknowledgement will also have to come back 
to the sender so a propagation delay will be added there as well this and this is the same the time to travel to, through the channel is the same okay so now we'll calculate this t transmission delay is given by l by b where l is the packet length and b is the bandwidth so in the question they have given that the packet length for the information frame is 1980 bytes and there is an overhead byte of 20 in the same packet so the total length of the packet is 1980 plus 20 bytes so for byte we'll multiply by 8 to get the total bits in that packet divided by bandwidth that was 10 raised to 6 mbps megabits per second that is 16,000 into 10 raised to minus 6 that is 16 milliseconds now we will look at propagation delay t propagation delay was given in the question it was 0.75 milliseconds the processing delay t processing is given here it is 0.25 milliseconds now we look at transmission delay for the acknowledgement frame which is t transmission for ACK that is 20 into 8 by 10 raised to 6 20 byte is the length of the ACK and 8 we multiply in order to convert it to bits divided by 10 raised to 6 megabit per second that is 0.16 milliseconds now let's look at efficiency for efficiency whatever this t transmission given here only this part we are using to send the packet the rest of the delays are just useless delays for sending to the receiver and all etc so for stop and wait the efficiency is given by this t transmission divided by the total times taken for the packet to reach the receiver and then acknowledgement to come back so efficiency will be t transmission divided by t transmission plus t propagation into 2 for this 2 plus t processing delay plus t time of acknowledgement so that is given by 16 divided by 16 plus 0.75 into 2 which I have given twice here 0 0.75 0 0.75 plus t processing delay plus t transmission of ACK that is 0 0.16 that is 16 by 17.91 they were asking us in percentages so we will multiply it by 100 which is 89.33 percentage this was the answer consider a database that has a relation schema CR student name course name an instance of the schema, schema CR is given below the following query is made on the DB T1 phi of, pi of course name sigma student name equals SA from CR and T2 is CR divided by T1 the number of rows in T2 is so this is a question from relational algebra in DBMS if you don't understand these notations like pi sigma and all and also database division please refer to the video lectures from dbms section for these so we'll try to see what this is t1 gives selection of student name equal to sa from cr and it's projecting for on course name meaning that it will select all the tuples in cr where student name equal to sa and from that table it will give this column course name only so this query will give us these three rows sa 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 and course name and selecting only course name will give this much part meaning t1 is this course name c a b c and then we need to find out t2 which is cr that table divided by this table so database division here cr is divided with t1 which means that cr divided by t1 would mean all the student names in CR that has a row associated with every course names in T1 so when we are doing that table divided by this table this table has only this column course name so when we are dividing this by this it will mean all these values that is student name column all the student names which has a row associated with each of the rows in this table meaning each student name that is associated with all CA, CB and CC. So let us look which all student names are there. SA as a row with CA, SA, CB, SA, CC is there. So SA we can take. CR divided by T1. This is the table student name. So SA is associated with CA, CB and CC all three. So we can write SA. SB has a row with CB and CC only. SB doesn't have a row with CA. So we can't take SB there. SC has a row with CA, CB and CC so we can take SC here SD has a row with CB, CC, CD it doesn't have a row with CA so SD we can't take SE has a row with CA and CB 
So actually, we have SD had SD had a row with CA also. So we can actually take SD SD CA SD CB SD CC. So SD we can take SE. No, it has only row with CA and B. It doesn't have a row with CC. SF has row with CA, CB, and CC. So SF also we can take. So this database has four rows. The question was the number of rows in T2. So the answer is four. The number of integers between 1 and 500, both inclusive, that are divisible by 3 or 5 or 7 is dash. So in the question, they are asking us to find the number of integers between 1 and 500 that is divisible by 3 or 5 or 7. So if you take a look at this Venn diagram, let A represent the number of, divis num num the number of numbers divisible by 3 and B represent the number of numbers divisible by 5 and C represent the number of numbers divisible by 7. We need to find the union of all these three. So in a Venn diagram, how to find the union of all these three is we need to add A, which is this circle, plus we need to add B, that is this circle, plus we need to add C, this circle. Now if you see, this part got added twice, just like this part and this part, both got added twice. So we need to subtract this part, that is intersection of A and B once. So we need to add A, we need to add B, we need to add C. We need to subtract intersection of A and B. We need to subtract intersection of A and C. We need to subtract intersection of B and C. So if you do this, the intersection of A, B, C, this part got added three times when we added A, B and C. This also got subtracted three times when we subtracted A, C, when we subtracted A, B, when we subtracted B, C. So finally, we need to add this part once again. That is, we need to add intersection of A, B and C, which means we need to add A plus B plus C minus intersection of AB minus intersection of AC minus intersection of BC plus intersection of ABC. This is what we need to add. So using this, we will find out the answer to this. The number of numbers divisible by 3 is 500 by 3. When, we, when I say 500 by 3, I am just taking the integer division. That is 166. There are 166 numbers between 1 and 500 inclusive that are divisible by 3. Similarly, divisible by 5 is 500 by 5, that is 100. Divisible by 7 is 500 by 7, that is 71. Now, we need to find out the numbers divisible by 3 and 5. If a number is divisible by 3 and 5, it means the number is divisible by 15. So that number is 500 by 15, that is 33. Similarly, divisible by 3 and 7 is divisible by 21, that is 500 by 21 equals 23. Divisible by 5 and 7 is 35, that is 500 by 35 equals 14. Now we need to find out the number of numbers divisible by 3, 5 and 7. If a number is divisible by 3, 5 and 7, it means that number is divisible by 105. Now that is 500 by 105 equals 4. Now, using this formula here, we can find out the number of numbers divisible by 3 or 5 or 7. That is, divisible by 3 plus divisible by 5 plus divisible by 7 minus divisible by 3 and 5 minus divisible by 3 and 7 minus divisible by 5 and 7 plus divisible by 3 and 5 and 7. That is 271. Let A be an array of 31 numbers consisting of a sequence of zeros followed by a sequence of 1s. The problem is to find the smallest index i such that a i is 1 by probing the minimum number of locations in a. The worst case number of probes performed by an optimal algorithm is dash. So in this question, we have been given an array of 31 numbers which will be a sequence of zeros followed by a sequence of ones and we need to find the index where that one starts. That is the smallest index i such that a i is 1. That's we need to find out where ones start. So they are asking if you are using the optimal algorithm to do this, what is the worst case number of props performed by this? So, if you look at this array, it will be a sorted array and we need to find out the index where zeros end and ones start. So, we can use binary search for that. So, first I will show it with an array of smaller numbers. Let us consider an array n of 7 numbers. These are, these are not zeros, these are the 7 locations and suppose the numbers associated with these are 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So this is the index where ones start. We need to find out this index. And they are asking what's the worst case number of props needed by this. So let us say I'm using binary search. What I will do is I'll take the middlemost element and I will check if it is 0 or 1. So there are seven nodes here. The small, the middlemost one is this one. So I'll choose this and I will check if it is 0 or 1. If it is 1, 
then the smallest index would be to the left of this either this or to the left of this if it is zero then it will be either the either it will be to the right side of that for definitely so it is one here meaning i will continue the probe to the left side to the left there are three nodes here again i will look at the middlemost one which is this so now i will see that it is zero previously it was one now it is zero it is zero means the index is definitely to the right side meaning i will check to the right side of this and this was one so now i saw this was zero and this was one and clearly this is the index where the smallest one is present and here i have only done three probes here now let us take it to n equal to 31 here now i have drawn 31 nodes here and let us say these are the numbers 0 0 0 and ones starting from here okay again i'll perform binary search in this so this is one this is 31 so the middlemost one will be this one 16 so this is my first probe i see that it is zero meaning i need to continue the probing to the right side of this to the right side there are 15 elements okay and out of 15 the middlemost one is here that's at position 8 in, in the right side so i will probe here i will see it is one meaning i need to check to the left side to the left side there will be seven nodes i will take the middlemost one that would be this one this is my third probe i see that it is zero i need to continue probing to the right side so this we have already probed this we have already probed now the binary search will shrink to these three nodes i will probe this that one is zero then i will probe it i will probe to the right side that one is one so this will always take five probes whatever combinations you take if from here if i go to left and then whichever side i can go it will be always five probes that's the worst case number of probes required for this algorithm to find out uh, the index where it starts so the answer to this question is five consider a risk machine where each instruction is exactly four bytes long conditional and unconditional branch instructions use pc relative addressing mode with offset specified in bytes to the target location of the branch instruction further the offset is always with respect to the address of the next instruction in the program sequence consider the following instruction sequence they have given us four sample instructions i i1 i one i plus one i plus two i plus three and the target of the branch instruction is i then the decimal value of offset is dash so in the question it's a question from computer organization here they have given us these four instructions and they are telling us that this is a branch instruction i plus three which has an offset now this offset should specify to which instruction it should be branching to and in the question they have given us that the target of this branch instruction should be i meaning this instruction should branch to instruction i so we need to find out what the offset should be now there are a few key points mentioned in the question one is that each instruction is exactly four bytes long and then the other important point is that the offset is always with respect to the address of the next instruction always with respect to the address of the next instruction okay and also they are saying that offset is specified in bytes to the target location of the branch instruction that to pc relative addressing mode now we'll take a look at this instruction let us say instruction i is at address zero we can take any sample address and each instruction will be four bytes long meaning the instruction i plus one will be at address four i plus two will be at address eight i plus three will be at address 12 and if there were one more instruction the next one would have had address 16. now after i plus three we need to branch to this address now when we are branching to this address that difference in these two addresses that's what we need to give in offset because they are specified is pc relative addressing mode so whatever is the difference between the current address and the address to which we should be branching to that should be given here now they have given one more thing that this offset is calculated with respect to the next instruction with respect to the address of the next instruction so if i plus 3 is the branching instruction the address of the next instruction is i plus 4 that is 16. now with respect to this we need to calculate the offset of i now i's address is 0 this one's address is 16 so the difference between these two is 0 minus 16 that is minus 16. so this will be the offset that we need to enter here in order to branch to instruction i so the answer is minus 16. 
This is a question from Computer Organization regarding pipelining topic. So the question text was very large, so I have written the summary here. If you want to read the full question, please refer to the question paper. So in the question they were saying that we have a five stage pipeline processor which has these five stages, which is instruction fetch IF which takes 5 nanosecond time. Then there is instruction decode stage which takes 4 nanoseconds time. Then there is operand fetch stage which took 20 nanoseconds time. Then there is execute stage which will take 10 nanoseconds of time and write back stage which takes 3 nanoseconds of time. Also there are buffers between each stage which will take an additional 2 nanoseconds time. Now they have given us two pipeline implementation of this same processor. In one, one is a naive pipeline implementation with these five stages written here. A second is an efficient pipeline implementation where this OF stage, which is operand fetch, that is divided into two stages, OF1 and OF2, with execution times of 12 nanoseconds and 8 nanoseconds respectively. The speed up corrected to decimal places achieved by EP over NP in executing 20 independent instructions with no hazard C's dash. So, in this question, they have given us two implementations of this pipeline processor. One is a naive implementation with these five stages. Second is an efficient implementation in which the operand fetch stage, this was the stage taking the largest amount of time, it has been divided into two parts, OF1 and OF8, OF2, which takes 12 nanosecond and 8 nanosecond time respectively. And they are asking us to calculate the speed up when in each of these we are executing 20 instructions. Now let's see how to do that. Let's take a look at the name implementation. NP. Okay. So here, what is the cycle time? Cycle time is the time taken by the slowest stage. So in this, the slowest stage here is operand fetch stage, which takes 20 nanoseconds time. So we need to take this as the cycle time. We will take 20 plus additionally there is 2 nanosecond time buffer associated with each stage meaning that the cycle time for the first implementation is 22 nanoseconds. Now let us see what will be the time taken to execute 20 instructions. Now the first instruction will take one cycle time for each of the stages in the pipeline. There are five stages in the pipeline as you can see here. Each of these stages will take one cycle time each. So for executing the first instruction it will take us 22 that is cycle time into five stages. 22 into 5. This, this is the time taken for the first instruction. But after this, pipelining will come into a picture and each additional instruction will only take one cycle time for executing. Meaning, the rest of the 19 instructions will take only one cycle time, that is 22. So, the total time taken is 22 into 19 plus 22 into 5, that is 528 nanoseconds. Now, let's look at the second implementation. Here, cycle time we need to see. So, here this stage is no longer there. This stage has been divided into two stages of 12 and 8. Now the slowest stage here is we have 5, 4, 12, 8, 10 and 3. So the slowest stage is OF1 which takes 12 nanoseconds time. So the cycle time would be 12 plus 2. The buffer is still the same. There is a buffer of 2 associated with each stage. That is total of 14 nanoseconds time. This is the cycle time. Now time for 20 instructions. That is for first instruction it will take one cycle time for each of the stages in the pipeline. There are six stages in the pipeline. There are these one, two, these four stages, and this stage has been divided into two stages now, OF1 and OF2. So there are a total of six stages. So the first instruction will take 14 into 6, this much time. And after that, from second instruction onwards, pipelining comes into the picture, and each instruction will take only one additional cycle time. So for the rest of the 90 instruction, it will take one cycle time only. So the total time is 14 into 6 plus 14 into 9, that is 350 nanoseconds. Now, the first implementation took 528 nanoseconds. The second implementation is only taking 350 nanoseconds. So the speed up of this over this, we can write it as time taken by first one divided by time taken by second one. That is 528 by 350. That is 1.51. This is the speed up of EP over NP. 1.51 is the answer. Consider a two-way set associative cache with 256 blocks and uses LRU replacement. Initially, the cache is empty. Conflict misses are those which occur due to contentation of multiple blocks for the same cache set. Compulsory misses occur due to the first time access to the block. The following sequence of access to memory blocks 
is repeated 10 times. They have given us a sequence of accesses. The number of conflict misses experienced by the cache is dash. So this is a question from caches in computer organization. They are asking us about replacement policies here. So in the question they have given us that the cache is a two-way set associative cache which has 256 blocks. So if there is 256 blocks and if it is two-way set associative, it means that there is 256 by 2 that is 128 sets. I have written line here. It is 128 sets in the cache or cache lines. Now this set number can be obtained by performing mod 128. To any memory block if we perform mod 128 we will get the set number. So these are the page accesses in the question given. So for 0, 128 and 256 if you take mod 128 you will see that it belongs to set 0. And also if you take 1, 128 and 257 if you take mod 128 you will see that these lines belong to set 1 in the cache. Now with information that let us look at the cache and how these pages get added to the cache. These blocks get added to the cache. So this is the first iteration. Let us say this is set 0 and this is set 1 in the cache. Okay? It is two-way set, set associative cache meaning at any time there can be two blocks available in, the, in this particular set, set 0 and set 1. And a black cross I am writing in order to donate, in order to notate compulsory misses and a red cross I am writing in order to denote conflict misses. Okay, so we'll start with set 0. So initially the memory access was to block 0. Now 0 goes to set 0. So we can add directly here. We'll add 0 here to the cache. Now this is the first time access so this will be a compulsory miss. Compulsory miss means first time access to a memory block. So 0 we'll add to the cache. The next one was 128. That also we will add to the cache. Now this set is full 0 and 128. Only two blocks we can keep in any set at one time. Now these two were compulsory misses. After that the third access was 256. So 256 is also first time access. So we need to add it to the cache. This will cause a compulsory miss. Uh, so now see 0 is gone from the cache. Now 128 and 256 are there in the cache. Now again we are accessing 128 now 128 is already there okay so this is no miss this is not a compulsory miss or a conflict miss anything i have just written 128 here so that it is using lru policy and i can see which is the latest two ones here so 128 was the last access it's 256 and 128 after that it is accessing zero now if you see the cache has 256 and 128 now it's accessing zero which is not there in the cache and it is not the first time that we are requesting zero we had access zero previously and zero is gone from the cache now we are requesting it again now this is a conflict miss it is not a compulsory miss so zero will be a conflict miss 250 is gone from cache after that it's accessing 128 again that is not a miss 128 we already had it here after that it is asking for 256 now again we had already access 256 which was there in the cache now it is gone from the cache now it's only zero and 128 is there in the cache now this is again a miss and it is a conflict miss it is not a compulsory miss so i have denoted a red cross here after that it's accessing 128 so 128 will come here it is the last access so that's not a miss 128 was already there in the cache so these eight accesses caused two conflict misses here okay now we look at set one here now those Eight access return where these eight here one two three four five six seven eight. After that one one twenty nine two fifty seven one twenty nine comes into picture. So one goes to set one. This is the first time we are accessing it. It's a compulsory miss. After it is one twenty nine that we add to the cache. That's a compulsory miss. Two fifty seven. That's also a compulsory miss. Now one is gone from the cache. After that one twenty nine. One ten we already had in the cache. So this is not a miss. Then we are asking for 1 again. Now 1 we are already added to the cache and now 1 is gone from the cache. This is a conflict miss. 257 is gone from cache. 129 again we are asking. It's already there. So this is not a miss. Then we are asking for 257. Now 257 also we are added to the cache. Now it is gone from the cache. So this is again a miss. It's conflict miss. 129 is there in the cache. So it's fine. So after one iteration we can see that it has caused 4 conflict misses. Now we look at iteration 2 as well. 
it's asking for 0. If you look here, 256 and 128 are the two elements which is there in the cache. So 0 is not there, meaning this is also a conflict miss. Now 256 is gone from the cache. We are asking for 128. 128 is there, so it is not a miss. Again, we are asking for 256. It is gone from the cache, conflict miss. We are asking for 128, it's there in the cache, not a miss. 0, conflict miss. 128, it's there in the cache, not a miss. 256, again, conflict miss. 128, it's there in the cache, so it is not a miss. Similarly, then we go with 1, 129. 1 is not there in the cache, 257 and 129 is there in the cache. So this is again a conflict miss. 257 is gone from the cache. Then we go to, one to we ask for 129, it is there in the cache, so it is fine. Not a miss. 257, gone from the cache, again a miss. 129, there in the cache, it is not a miss. Again 1, now 1 is gone from the cache now, so this is a miss. 129 is there in the cache, it's fine. 257 is not there, so it's again another conflict miss. And 129 is there in the cache, so it is not a miss. So if you see, in iteration 2, we have 8 conflict misses. Now after iteration 2, set 1, set 0 has 256 and 128, set 1 has 257 and 129, which is same as what we had after iteration 1, 256 and 128, 257 and 129. So we can say that in iteration 3 also, it will just repeat what is happening here. So iteration 3 will add 8 more conflict misses. It will keep on going till iteration 10. In the question, they are given us that it was repeated 10 times. See. So iteration 1 will give us 4 conflict miss, iteration 2 will give us 8 conflict miss up to iteration 10 which will give us 8 conflict misses. So the total is 4 plus 8 into 9 iteration that is total 76. Consider the expression a minus 1 into b plus c by 3 plus d. Let x be the minimum number of registers required by an optimal code generation algorithm for a load or store architecture in which 1. Only load and store instructions can have memory operands and 2. Arithmetic instructions can have only register or immediate operands. The value of x is. So in the question we have been given this particular expression. Now we need to find out the minimum number of registers needed when we convert it to intermediate code. So it's a question for intermediate code generation section. We need to convert this particular long expression into intermediate code address three address codes and then we need to find out the minimum number of registers needed here first of all we need to load a b c and d and then we need to perform the operation so actually the answer to this is two i will show you how we can do that one let us three let, let us do this load r1 b we are loading b load r2 c we are loading c2 registers r2 we are loading b register r1 so already two registers have been used up then I am performing add R1, R2. This means R2 and R1 will be added and the result will be stored in R1. Now this R1 will have B plus C stored in it. Now divide R1 with 3. Now it is saying that we can have immediate operands as well in arithmetic instructions. So we are performing divide R1 3 means whatever is in R1 will be divided by 3 and the result will be stored in R1 only. So now R1 becomes B plus C by 3. Now we are doing load R2 D. So D is loaded into R2. Add R1 R2 meaning R1 plus R2 is put into R1. Now R1 will have B plus C by 3 plus D stored in it. Now we load R2 to A. We load A to R2. After that we are doing subtract R2 1. So R2 becomes A minus 1. After that we are doing multiply R2 R1. So R1 and R2 will be multiplied and the result will be stored to R2. So R2 had A minus 1. R1 had B plus C by 3 plus D, so that is total stored in R2 would be A minus 1 into B plus C by 3 plus D. This is the same expression given in the question. As you can see, I've only used two registers here. The, this is the minimum also. The answer to this question is 2. Consider the following C program. They have given us this particular program here. And they're saying that recall that strlen is defined in string dot h as returning a value of type size underscore t which is an unsigned int the output of the program is so this is a very simple question but a tricky one from c programming section 
in here they are given two strings car star x is a b c and y is d e f g h now these two strings are passed to this function as s and t now s is a b c and t is d e f g h and unsigned int c is zero now they are doing int len equal to strlen s minus strlen t greater than c if it is greater than c then return strlen s then ret otherwise return strlen of t and they are printing that length so strlen of s is 3 and strlen is the length of t t was d e f g h that is 5 and in this step we are doing 3 minus 5 but strlen s and strlen t is returning of type size t which is unsigned in that is given in the question so we are doing 3 minus 5 for 2 unsigned in so the answer won't be minus 2 since it is unsigned int it will be int max minus 2 which is a very last number that's what it will be returning since these two are unsigned now that we are comparing it with c which is also unsigned is int max minus 2 greater than 0 obviously it is greater than 0 it's a very large number in that case since this is true, it will be returning this part, which is strlen of s. strlen s is 3 here. So we are printing len as that. So the output of the program would be 3. A cache memory unit with capacity of n words and block size of b words is to be designed. If it is designed as a direct mapped cache, the length of the tag field is 10 bits. If the cache is now designed as a 16-way set associative cache, the length of the tag field is dash bits. So this is a question from caches coming from a computer organization. So you need to understand direct mapped cache, set associative map, associative mapped cache, all these in order to understand this question. So you can refer to the video lectures to understand more about those. So in this question, I will explain one property associated with direct mapped and k-way set associative cache. So every physical memory, we can divide it into three parts. One is the tag bits. Then we need a number of bits to represent the block number. Now this block number in a set associative cache, it will represent the set number. In a direct mapped cache, it can be this, this line number. Okay. So we need tag bits. We need number of bits for block number. After that, we need a few bits for the block offset. Now, whether it is a direct mapped cache or an n way set associative mapped cache, you can see that this is the block size. In two-way set associative also, this is the block size, okay. So the block size remains same in all of these. So the bits for block offset, that remains the same in all of these type of caches, okay. So let's look at the first one. Suppose it's a direct mapped cache having eight lines, zero to seven. And let us say the tag bits is three bits here. So we need three bits for tag bits. And we need three bits to represent which line it will be mapped to. It's a direct map cache, right? So there are can be eight unique lines. Eight lines need three bits in order to uniquely represent the line number. So the tag will take three bits. The line number will take three bits. So the total we need six bits. After that, we need some bits for block offset. Now the block offset part remains same for all of these caches. Okay. So we need three bits here. We need three bits here. So totally six bits. Now coming to a two-way set associative mapped cache this total bits remains same here also we will need six bits to represent the tag bit plus whatever set number it represents and the remaining block offset that remains same that remains constant for this this and this meaning being for tag bits plus line number bits we need only six bits in all of these three so if you look here representing the set number needs how many bits so here there are only four sets map 0 1 2 3 so for representing four sets uniquely we need only two bits so set number takes two bits and we know the total it will be six bits only if the physical address space and the cache size remains constant this part remains constant right so set number takes two bits this part takes six bits meaning the tag bit will take six minus two that is four bits here similarly if you take a four-way set associative cache map there will only be two sets here now each set can have four blocks here now here the set number takes only one bit for representing zero or one we need only one bit and total is again 6 bits now we can see that the tag bits take 6 minus 1 that is 5 bits here so if you look here the property of direct mapped and k-way set associative mapped cache is that when you convert a direct mapped cache to a k-way set associative tag suppose the direct mapped cache needs x bits for tag 
then the number of tag bits required for the same k by set associative cache is x plus log to the base 2 of k bits this is assuming that the physical address space and the cache size remains constant so if direct needs x bits k by set associative cache will need x plus log to the base 2 of k bits that's what i have shown you here so in the question we can directly apply that the question it is given that that for direct map cache the tag field is 10 bits now they are asking for a 16 way set associative cached map what would be the length of the tag fit so we can calculate that direct needs 10 bits plus 16 way means log to the base 2 of 16 bits for tag so the total is 14 bits that was the answer this is a c programming question here they have given us this particular code and they are asking us on executing this what the output would be so let's look at the main function here they have defined a static int x equal to 0 and i is made 5 and while i is greater than 0 each time it is decrementing i by 1 it is doing x equal to x plus total of i and then at the end they are printing the value of x so inside the loop i changes from 5 4 3 2 1 and when it becomes 0 it will exit so from 5 to 1 this part will execute meaning it will be calling initially i is 5 so initially it will call total of 5 x equal to x plus total of 5 then it will do total of 4 total of 3 total of 2 total of 1 etc so total will be called for 5 4 3 2 and 1 so let's look at this function total here there is a static int count that is defined as 0 so since it is a static int there will only be one instance of this variable throughout function call so each function call this variable won't be different so there will only be a single instance of count throughout the program and whenever count is changed that count value will be incremented since it is static so static in count is initially 0 and then inside this while loop count plus equal to v and 1 now this operator is bitwise and what it does is it does bitwise and of v and 1 meaning v can be any number so many zeros and ones and it is doing bitwise and of 1 this number 1 is nothing but 0 0 0 0 the final bit is 1 so when this is when we do bitwise and of this with some number for all the zeros it will return 0 in that number and only for the final one if it is 1 in that number it will return 1 else if it is 0 in the number it will return 0 so basically v and 1 will do bitwise and with 1 and it will return 1 if the final if the least significant bit in v is 1 if the least significant bit in v is 1 it will return 1 otherwise it will return 0 okay so and then in the next line it is doing v shift right equal to 1 so here what we are doing is the number v we are shifting it to right so let us say v is 1010 10. when we shift right this number once what will happen is we'll shift it to right this bit will go outside and the final would be these three bits plus a zero will be added to the left side okay so this is shift right what it is doing so if you look here it is comparing the least significant bit with one and then it is doing shift right and then it is comparing again least significant bit with one and then again it will do shift right similarly so whenever so look at this number okay let us say it is 101 when we do shift right when we do bitwise and with one it will return one because this number is one okay so it will return one and again we do shift right meaning this bit will go out now the least significant bit is zero we will do shift weights and with one this will return zero again when we do shift right this bit will go away the final bit is this when we do shift bitwise and with one again this will also return one so initially the number was 101 and two times it returned one so this is kind of like counting the number of ones in the number v so this entire loop will count the number of ones in the number v and it will add it to count okay so let us see what happens when we call total with different numbers let us see we are calling total of one when we call total of one the number is one okay how many bits of ones are there how many bits are one that is only one so total of one will add one to count if we call total of two the number is one zero there's only a single one here so again it will add one to count 
if you do total of three the number is one one there are two ones here so it will add two to count four is one zero zero five is one zero one so four and five will add one and two respectively to count now let us look at the program execution okay so initially x is zero and we are doing x plus total of five total of five will add two to count and initially count is zero when we add it to count becomes two and at the end it is returning count so total of five here will return two so effectively this operation becomes x equals to x plus two okay and then x will become two now after that it will again call total of four now so let us see what happens when we call total of four when we call total of four it will add one to count so count was two now it becomes three when we call total of three it will add two to count so count is three now from here to three we'll add two so it will return five again after that when we call total two it will add one to count so count will become from five to six so to when we call total one after that count becomes from six to seven so these are the return values of the functions total 5 4 3 2 1 respectively so what happens in this loop is initially it will become x equal to x plus 2 since 2 is returned by count of total of 5 after it will become x equal to x plus 3 since 3 is returned by total of 4 then again it will become x equal to x plus 5 since 5 is returned by total of 3 then it becomes x equals x plus 6 since 6 is will be returned by total of 2 after it will become x equal to x plus 7 since 7 is returned by total of 1 so each time initially x was 0 x becomes 2 now when we add 3 it becomes 5 when we add 5 it becomes 10 when we add 6 it becomes 16 when we add 7 it becomes 23 so after this loop x becomes 23 and then we are printing 23 so that is the answer this is a general English question. We have been given a statement with a blank in between and we need to fill it with the appropriate word from the given options. After Rajendra Chola returned from his voyage to Indonesia, he dashed to visit the temple in Tanjavur. Now, as it can be seen from the options that they are about the tenses and the main clause after Rajendra Chola returned from his voyage, it is suggesting the usage of simple past tense. So the option which we'll be putting over here also needs to be in the form of simple past tense itself. And it can be seen that this option A was wishing. This is the past continuous tense. Option B is present continuous tense. And option C is the simple past tense which can be put over here wished. Option D is had wished means past perfect tense. Hence the appropriate word would be to put wished over here after Rajendra Chula returned from his voyage to Indonesia he wished to visit the temple in Tanjavur that makes sense hence we shall go with option C wished this is a general English fill in the blank type of question research in the workplace reveals that people work for many reasons dash now here from the given options we can see that the sentence is trying to convey that there are other reasons for people to work as well and not just money money is there but it is not the prime purpose there are other reasons in addition to that and hence the appropriate form of this preposition beside to be used in the context of in addition of would be besides means beside with an s would convey the meaning besides so looking at the option D besides money, it would make the complete sense that people have other reasons to work as well besides money. Hence, this is the correct fit for this place and we shall go with option D besides money. This is a seating arrangement type of question. There are four friends, Rahul, Murli, Srinivas and Arul sitting around a square table. So this will be the table and they will be sitting each at these sides and they will face inside by default it is saying that rahul is sitting to the left of murli so let us say murli is sitting over here then this will be his right and left rahul is to the left of murli so rahul will be over here and for rahul this will be right this will be left now srinivas is sitting to the right of arul now if we make a rule to sit over here then for him since he is facing inside this will be the right and this will be left so for a rule towards the right there is Srinivas so 
Srinivas would be over here. For him, this will be right and this will be left. But if we had made Arul to sit in this particular direction, then towards his right, there would be Rahul. There would have been no space left for Srinivas. Hence, Arul would be sitting in this direction. Then towards his right, we can make Srinivas to sit. Hence, this is the possible arrangement they are talking about. And now, based upon this, we need to determine which of the following pairs are seated opposite to each other. So, there are two pairs, Srinivas and Murli, Rahul and Arul. And from the given pairs, the option we can see over here is C, Srinivas and Murli. So, we shall go with option C. This is a mathematical aptitude question. We have been given a number y such that y into 162 is a perfect cube. We need to find the smallest value of y that satisfies this particular equation. Now we know that for a perfect cube, we need to have numbers of kind this a cube, b raised to 6, something like this, where all the powers are multiples of 3. So that for this number, we can say it is a perfect cube having the cube root ab square. Hence, in this particular number also, we shall find all the factors and make sure that the powers of all the factors are multiples of 3. Then only it will be a perfect cube. So we can find the factors of 162 as 2 into 81 or 2 into 9 square or 2 into 3 raised to 4. This is the least prime factorization of 162. So for y into 162, that will become y into 2, 2 raised to 1 into 3 raised to 4. And now they are saying this is a perfect cube. Means all the powers will be multiples of 3. So here we can see that we have 2 raised to 1. So in order to make it the least multiple of 3, we need in addition 2 square so that 2 raised to 1 and 2 raised to 2. In together that will become 2 cube and it will be a perfect cube. Similarly for 3 raised to 4 in addition we need a 3 square so that 4 plus 2 6 that will also become a multiple of 3. Hence if we make y equal to this particular thing 2 square into 3 square then the entire thing becomes 2 square 3 square 2 raised to 1 3 raised to 4 which can be combined as 2 cube 3 raised to 6. Now this looks like a perfect cube. Hence the value of y which we used is 2 square into 3 square which is 4 into 9 or 36. That is the smallest possible value of y which would give us this particular product to be a perfect cube. Hence the correct answer is d 36. This question is based upon probability. We need to find the probability that a k digit number does not contain the digits 0, 5 or 9. Now in total there are 10 digits from 0 to 9 and we want a k digit number such that these three numbers 0, 5 and 9 are excluded. So taking out these three numbers from the total we would be left with the other seven numbers which would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8. These are the seven numbers we are having and only from these seven numbers we need to form a k digit number. So each of these k digits will have seven choice. So the total possible numbers would be 7 raised to k. These are the viable numbers which are allowed in our set and the total possible numbers would have been with this universal set using all the 10 numbers. In that case the total available choices would be 10 raised to k out of which we are using only 7 raised to k. So the probability becomes 7 on 10 raised to k which is 0.7 raised to k. So this is the probability of having such kind of numbers without these three digits. So the correct option is C 0.7 raised to k. This is a reasoning based question. A statement has been given and based upon that we need to determine which of these four options hold true. The hold of the nationalist imagination on our colonial past is such that anything inadequately or improperly nationalist is just not history. Which means the author is trying to con convey the fact that the nationalist imagination is such that based upon whatever has happened in our colonial past, they are not ready to accept anything which has been inadequately or improperly nationalist 
to be a part of their history means the nationalists only consider the nationalist friendly activities which have happened to be a part of their history and they do not they are not ready to accept anything other which is deviating from their nationalist philosophy to be a part of their history so now based upon that let us have a look at the options nationalists are highly imaginative this fact is not being conveyed they are not imaginative they are just uh, too much affected by their own thoughts that they are not ready to accept anything which is anti national kind of thing to be a part of their history so they are highly biased on their own imagination but that does not mean that they are imaginative so we'll discard this option history is viewed through the filter of nationalism this particular statement can be drawn from the given line because uh, whatever has happened in the history is being viewed through this nationalist imagination their philosophy and whatever is seem to be anti national is trying to be discarded from the history hence the history is being tampered with it is being viewed through the filter of nationalism and anything found to be anti national is going to be discarded from that history hence this option is correct this philosophy states that nationalist imagination has affected the history and anything deviation will not be tolerated let us also look at option c our colonial past never happened again this fact is not being conveyed the colonial past had happened but how it is being presumed in the current time that is decided by this nationalist imagination now last option nationalism has to be both adequately and properly imagined this particular statement need might be true but it is not properly getting conveyed from the given line because Uh, they are talking about the historical events which are not inadequately and properly nationalist and they are being discarded from the history nationalist philosophy wants everything to be as per their own philosophical rules and regulations and deviations are not tolerated that does not mean that nationalism has to be properly imagined it just implies that history should comply with their philosophy and if that does not happen they are not happy with it hence the correct option we will go here with is option b this question is based upon the seating arrangement it is saying that six people are seated around a circular table so the table will be like this and let us say six people are seated at these places there are at least two men and two women so men women greater than equal to 2 greater than equal to 2 and in total there are six people there are at least three right handed persons right handed and left handed right handed are at least three every woman has a left handed person to her immediate right now there are at least two women and each of them is having a left handed person to her immediate right let us say one woman w1 is here Uh, all of them are facing inside so to her right means in this particular side there is a left handed person l1 and there might be there are at least two women so another woman might be sitting at some other place we are not sure about none of the women are right handed means all the women are left handed so this w1 is also left handed so this will be l1 this will be l2 and they are saying that there are more than or equal to 3 right handed people and in total there are 6 so the combinations for right and left are 3 3 4 2 and 6 0 but we already saw that we already know that there are at least two women and all the women are left handed so these two cases are discarded these two are favorable outcomes now among them let us see which are the possibilities uh, let us say that this is also a woman w2 so she will also be left handed but now every woman has a left handed person to her immediate right so to her right also there has to be a left handed person l3 now this l3 can be both a man or a woman both are the possibilities so what can be the feasible solution over here 
we want to find out the number of women at the table if we again consider this to be a woman then again to her right we would need to put a left handed person and that will go on and all the people will become left handed at the table but we need to ensure that there are at least three right handed as well so we will let m1 a male person to sit over here because male can be both right handed as well as left handed both are allowed so we'll keep this to be a man left handed and remaining three people will now be right handed r1 r2 r3 all of them will be men so this is the possible solution in this case because if we put any more women then we'll need to include an extra left handed person that would violate this case that r is greater than or equal to 3 so this is the possible solution and in this case we have only two women at the table so the correct answer would be a two women this is a mathematical aptitude based question an expression has been given x plus y minus of modulo x minus y the whole divided by 2 this expression is equivalent to which of these four options that we need to evaluate now since there is a modulo expression let us take two cases case 1 x is greater than y in this case the expression would be opened as x plus y minus of since x is greater than y this expression would be positive so we will directly open it x minus y by 2 now this thing will give us x plus y minus x plus y this whole thing by 2 x gets cancel out so we get this thing to be y and in this case y was the smaller among them let us also look at case 2 over here x is less than y in this case the modulo will be opened with a negative sign so that will be x plus y minus of minus becomes plus so plus of x minus y the whole by 2 that becomes x plus y plus x minus y by 2 here y will get cancelled and we'll get the value as x in this case again x was the smaller among the two so in either cases even if x is greater or x is lesser the result which we get is the smaller among the two numbers hence the correct option would be b the expression evaluates to the minimum of x and y if x is lesser then case 2 will be satisfied x will be returned and if y is lesser then case 1 will be satisfied and y will be returned so the correct option is b it always returns the minimum of x and y this is a pnc based question there are four friends arun gulab neel and shweta they must choose one shirt each from a pile of four shirts colored red pink blue and white and it is said that arun dislikes the color red so let us denote it by this arun dislikes red shweta dislikes white so this is how we'll denote that now gulab and neel like all the colors in how many ways can they all choose the shirts so that no one gets a shirt with a color that he or she dislikes so now we need to find a number of distributions of these shirts among the four friends such that Arun does not get red and Shweta does not get white other than that all the combinations are allowed so from the total number of combinations we can subtract these cases when Arun gets red union Shweta gets white so let us find out the number of ways in which Arun can get a red color for this what we'll do we'll assign red color to Arun and let the other three distribute it among themselves in total number of ways which would be 3 factorial 3 friends and 3 shirts total ways 3 factorial which is 6 similarly for the case shweta gets white here we'll assign white to shweta and let the other three distribute among total number of ways so again 3 factorial equal to 6 but now we want the union of these two so that would be given as arun gets red number of ways in which arun gets red plus number of ways in which shweta gets white minus number of ways in which arun gets red and shweta gets white because this particular case is getting double counted in either of them it is included in both of them so it would be subtracted one time 
so here we have one case when arun gets red and shweta gets white so in this case these two are already allocated their shirts so the remaining two people distribute two shirts among themselves in two factorial equal to two ways so we add these two and subtract the last one which means 6 plus 6 minus 2 equal to 10 ways so these are the total number of ways which would be removed from our solution and what is the solution set that is total minus 10 which we just found out but what is this total the total number of ways in which four people can distribute four shirts among themselves so total distribution would be 4 factorial means 24 and among these 24 what are the number of cases we are removing 10 cases so the answer we get is 24 minus 10 equal to 14 these 10 ways are those in which either arun gets red or shweta gets white so we removed all those and the final answer we got is 14 so we'll go with option d 14 This is a data interpretation type of question. It is saying that a counter line joins locations having the same height above the mean sea level. The following is a counter plot of a geographical region which has been represented in this picture. The counter lines are shown at 25 meter intervals in this plot, which means if we have two adjacent counter lines and one of them is representing the elevation of x, then the other would be representing x plus or minus 25 meters elevation. Now if in a flood the water level rises to 525 meters then which of the villages P Q R S and T will get submerged that we need to find out Now looking at uh, this particular village R we can see that it is adjacent to this particular counter line and if this is having an elevation of 450 then this one adjacent to it would be having 425 So elevation at this point is 425 meters and it is also adjacent to this particular line which is representing the elevation of 500 which means elevation at this point is 500 so r is lying between 450 to 500 means it will get submerged in this flood of 525 meters uh, looking at village p this is 550 so the adjacent line would be of 575 means it is greater than 525 meters elevation so p will not get submerged and looking at village s it is lying between these two counter lines of 450 and the adjacent one would be 475 so s is between 450 to 475 so it will also get submerged in this flood then looking at village q the adjacent uh, counter line is representing an elevation of 550 so the line next to it would represent 575 Uh, but the one inside that would be 575 actually and this one outside it would also represent the line which is greater than 25 so this q is having an elevation of greater than 450 it might be between 450 to 475 so it will also not get submerged and now looking at this last village t this particular line is representing 500 so the one next to it would be 525 and hence this t also lies between 500 to 525 hence it will also get submerged due to this 525 meters of flood hence the villages which are at the verge of submergence during this 525 meters of water level would be r s and t that is represented in this option c so we would go with that so option c would be the answer